Hey, folks, the uh, Sunset Lake 420 sale is still going on right now. It started on the 13th and it ends on the 24th at midnight at 11.59 p.m. 40% off smokables like hemp flour, pre-rolls, and keef, and 30% off everything else. No pro promo code is needed. The products are already discounted on the website. Uh, so, I mean, it. this is also for a good cause because Majority Report and Sunset Lake have paired up with the Innocence Project. They, we've teamed up with everyone's uh, on everyone's favorite stoner holiday. Into, and we've turned it into a fundraising opportunity for the Innocence Project, a great organization working to undo the damage of the war on drugs. Here's how it works. Visit sunsetlakesebede.com. Starting Wednesday, April 13th, Sunset Lake Sebede will be offering 40% off smokables like hemp flour, pre-rolls, and keef, as I mentioned, and every other product, 30% off. The tincture I have mentioned is my favorite Sunset Lake product. I use it all the time. I mean, Matt uses the, what would you say, the Keef? Uh, I use the Keef and the Smalls, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I want Sam and Emma are big tincture heads. Yes, we are. Um, although, I just, uh, I, I would rather not be associated with him any longer. So, um, maybe I'm going to go with the Smalls and the Keef. Sunset Lake will donate 4.2% of sales, 4.20 in fact. Of its sales to the Innocence Project, a nonprofit organization that works to free the innocent, prevent wrongful convictions, and create fair, compassionate, and equitable systems of justice for everyone. Sunset Lake Sebede is a majority employee owned business that donated more than $26,000 last year to anti drug war organizations, animal shelters, union strike funds, nature conservation, food shelves, and refugee resettlement organizations. Again, visit Sunset Lake Sebede. Dot com to take advantage of these discounts and help Majority Report raise money for a great organization. The sale ends on the 24th, April 24th. Don't miss it. And with that, we're on to this program. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me and i welcome their hatred we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex the majority report with sam cedar <laughs> and i get the feeling you've been cheated it is monday april 18th 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Gina Dent, Associate Professor of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, to discuss her recent book, Abolition Feminism Now, co-written with Angela Davis, Erica Miners, and Beth Ritchie. Meanwhile, Russian forces launched one of its broadest attacks since the invasion it started earlier this morning with missiles launched into mostly the eastern part of the country, but also in the western city of Lviv, where seven have died. That city was largely untouched thus far in the war. Israeli police once again attacked the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Sunday during Ramadan and Passover, bringing the total injured to over 170 when combined with Friday's assault. The U.S. arrested over 200,000 migrants attempting to cross the border from Mexico last month, the highest, highest monthly total in two decades. Nothing will fundamentally change, said Biden. Remember that? And in South Carolina, two shootings rocked the state over the weekend. 14 were injured at a mall in Columbia, South Carolina, when two shooters opened fire, reportedly. And then nine were injured at a separate shooting at a restaurant and bar a day later. Legal cannabis will officially start sales in New Jersey the day after 420 this week, this Thursday. It's taken a long, it's been a long road. 
And the FDA has authorized the first coronavirus breath test, which can be administered at pop-up sites and doctor's offices with results in a few minutes. But thus far, it'll fail to detect around one in every 10 positive cases. So we're still figuring these things out. And lastly, Alex Jones's InfoWars has filed for bankruptcy in the wake of the multiple defamation lawsuits that Jones is facing. So there is some good news today. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. It is April 18th, which means it is my birthday. Yes. Happy birthday. Hey. Uh, we'll celebrate a little bit more in the fun half, have some good times. Uh, but, you know, should we just talk about basketball the entire the entire podcast, man? I mean, you're, that's a, yeah. is that a new Timberwolves hat that you have on? No, it's an old one that I, uh, you know, I like rolled it. my cat hairs off. And uh, it's time to bust out the Timberwolves stuff. I'm a fan now. I'm a fan again. You're, I mean, it's like if if the Knicks ever have like this amount of young talent, I will be back on the train again. If the Knicks ever had a prospect like Anthony Edwards, I'm worried about. I, I'd be worried about New York City. Oh my could, god! Be imposed martial law or something. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would have to. You saw what happened when they won one playoff game against the Hawks. I thought like the entire city was gonna sink into the ground. I'd get a blue and orange suit. If Anthony Edwards was on the on the Knicks, and just wear it to the office. Yeah, I would wear it every day, probably. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like the, I, I love, I do care about the Knicks. I love them, but it's difficult to be engaged on a yearly basis with the way that they conduct their business. Um, so, go Rangers. That's all I have to say right now. That's where all of my energy is directed. But I am into the NBA playoffs. Great weekend this weekend of games. Um, transcendent. Transcendent. So let's get into the, it's a bit of a slow news day today, I would say, but I want to keep shining a light on this uh, broader unionization push around the country. Although we, when we spoke to Alex Press last week about it, she wasn't trying to be a Debbie Downer, but she was just not trying to downplay the enormous obstacles that unionization efforts still face throughout the country. And those obstacles are led by very well-funded and uh, well-financed capitalists who make it their mission to stamp out union efforts in the country and they spend millions and millions of dollars on union busting lawyers and firms like amazon did here is amazon ceo andy jassy people uh i think may not even know that bezos is uh now in a different role jassy is now the ceo probably because Amazon's board figure that Bezos has become like kind of a Lex Luthor figure for everybody who is uh, <laughs> trying to call attention to income inequality in this country. So this guy is supposed to be the new fresh face for Amazon. And yet it's the same old rhetoric, anti-union. Well, we're not anti-union. Everyone should have the freedom to do so. But here are the reasons why we are actually against unions and why we spent millions in order to prevent one union or two unions from sprouting up in our facilities because we understand it's an existential threat to uh, not the business, but to the uh, $212 million payments in a year that Amazon CEO Andy Jassy received. How do you see the union movement uh, that's taking place, frankly, around the country, but clearly aimed in certain places uh, and I'm thinking about New York, where I'm from, at Amazon. Well, I mean, I'd say a few things. You know, first of all, of course, it's it's employees' choice whether or not they want to join a union. Um, we happen to think they're better off not That's doing so for a couple of reasons, at least. You know, first, uh, a place like Amazon empowers employees if they see something they can do better for customers or for themselves, then go meet in a room, decide how to change it, and change it. That type of empowerment doesn't happen when you have unions. It's much more bureaucratic. Uh, that is not the experience Smalls had at the Staten Island when mm. they're talking about, hey, uh, you're not protecting us from this pandemic that's uh, going to kill uh, close to a million people. It's much slower. Now, I also think people are better off having direct connections with their managers. You know, you, you think about work differently. You have relationships that are different. We get to hear from a lot of people as opposed to it all being filtered through one voice. 
if you want to keep the construct. Yeah, a lot of we do get to hear from a lot of people, including people like Christian Smalls, who we fired in retaliation for speaking out about this. Yeah, their own individual connections that that isn't like sort of coordinated in any way. And sort of everybody is individually kept in the dark as to what other people are negotiating. So it is easier. We just prefer to be, our workers to be atomized. It's the solution we prefer for an efficient uh, wage setting. Yes. Uh, it, <laughs> right. I just love that concept. Like, you know, as opposed to hearing one voice who would uh, have a unified uh, message behind how we want wages to increase and working conditions to improve we'd rather it be completely dispersed so that our workers don't have the ability to coordinate with one another and by the way cnbc maybe have a worker on maybe have one yeah for five minutes on a question like this. yeah or just like you know uh right it, it, as a counterbalance in terms of like uh not just allowing the ceo of amazon to now, to spout out how uh it's empowering to not be in a union yeah now that's the fairness doctrine i want to see implemented oh hell yeah they're different we get to hear from a lot of people as opposed to it all being filtered through one voice if you want to keep the construct that we've had for for this long you have to have you know, competitive and, and compelling benefits, though, for for employees. And it's why we championed the fifteen dollar minimum wage a few years ago. And Pause over- it. Uh, you did not champion the fifteen dollar minimum wage. The only reason that was implemented was because Bernie Sanders started and you parlayed his um, popularity coming out of the 2016 presidential election to introduce the Stop Bezos Act, B-E-Z. O S as an acronym in order to raise wages. And then with his public pressure, Disney did the same, but Amazon did the same and they were forced into doing so because there was so much push against their unfair work, uh, work practices. And again, it's, it's so fork tongued whenever they do this uh, $15 minimum wage thing, because those, the jobs that they're replacing these warehouse jobs pay a hell of a lot more, particularly when they're unionized than $15. Mm-hmm. And it's Amazon, the, the, this mass spreading of these Amazon warehouses is undercutting those, uh, wages so it's not i'm glad you support 59 minimum wage a giant monopoly of that size can do that in a way that frankly advantages them over smaller firms for which like that's a bigger ask but amazon has so much money that of course they can do measly 59 minimum wage 18 dollars now it's why we have full insurance why 401k 20 weeks of paid leave and you, you, our career choice program where in our fulfillment center career choice and actually, <laughs> it's, just, it's just there's so much here <laughs> the way that he mentions those sort of ba- very basic things like the, the the basic benefits of things like health care this is why corporations don't want the government to provide stuff mm-hmm. like that so they can use it as a oh look at us look at how great we're doing something that when all these capitalists like this um donate to politicians whether it's democrat or republican they're doing it to politicians that aren't going to take those things off the table yes. for them. And a reminder, too, that if you are a worker who is a gig uh, employee by Amazon, you do not fall right. under the umbrella that he's speaking about that right there. Um, they uh, they don't provide those same benefits. We keep going. Paid leave. And you, you, our career choice program where in our fulfillment center um, for our employees who want to get a college education, we'll pay for their full tuition. So. Those things really matter. Um, the one thing regard again, just on how <laughs> there's so much here. Right? I know, yeah. It's, it's all these different things that they like to get basically like tax deductible. Uh, I don't know how the, it works on the business side, but it's it's a way that advantages them. Mm-hmm. Regardless of how it all evolves, is we just won't compromise on the customer experience. That for us, you know, is, is paramount. And what did you think when you heard President Biden effectively say, and this is in regard to the unions around Amazon? Here we come. Well, <laughs> everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And, uh, um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of things that we, I think, have supported the administration on and agree with them on. You know, some of the way that we've um, tried to help with COVID and with uh, immigration. And Pause it. Hmm. Okay. With immigration... What's that? I don't understand what that's... Uh... With COVID, they issued a press release in early January 2021 trying to say, we will help with the vaccine rollout, Biden administration. Not sure anything came of that because that was largely outsourced to farmers, uh, to, to drugstores, uh, which has its own issues, by the way. Um, al- although there were some state, you know, pop-up clinics like here in New York, et cetera. But uh, in terms of like the booster effort, that's all yeah. drugstores. Um 
but 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 I don't even think anything came of that. They just like they they thought that that would make them look good. Yeah. So that's what they. they and, and because I'm sorry, really quickly, Matt, like it, Amazon has the because we are such a like backwards country in terms of how we have developed our infrastructure for these kinds of things. Amazon understands that because they're such a massive monopoly and they have such wide tentacles throughout the country that don't that are in reach areas that the government can't that they have the leverage to exert that kind of power on the biden administration if they so cho chose to yeah and so that that pr failed but also bro the uh, union that just formed did so specifically on uh concerns of covid safety and how yeah. your company wasn't addressing it so i'm glad your um uh you know public initiatives uh you know that's all good and well but this is specifically to the unionizing that's why they're doing it yeah, I don't think we really need to hear that much more. It just, uh, yeah, that's what that. do we think of his? Uh, They're terrified. Sort of look, he's got the sort of like frazzled hair, a suit with like a. I know it looks like there's paint stains there's on like it. Weird little like salt and pepper sort of like. It's that kind of thing when you're so rich that you know, I'm sure that jacket is twenty thousand dollars or something like that. The but... fun rich guy. Yeah. <laughs> I want polka dot suit next. All right, we have to take a quick break. But when we come back, we will be joined by Gina Dent. First, we have, yeah, a bunch of sponsors. I got it, Bradley. I got it. It's your birthday. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. Hell yeah. So we, I believe this is a new sponsor for us today. Free email services like Gmail and Yahoo aren't really free. You pay with your privacy. Internet giants exploit your data by selling it to the highest bidder, but with Smart Mail, you can feel safe again. Smart Mail keeps your email private. Every email can be encrypted, even if the recipient doesn't use encryption. When you delete an email in Smart Mail, it is gone forever, as opposed to these other services, like they mentioned. Switching to Smart Mail is seamless. Transfer all your current email data instead of starting from scratch. Smart Mail uses their own servers and is backed by the most stringent pri uh, privacy laws in the world. With smart mail, you get unlimited anonymous aliases. So when you're giving your email to a company but want to protect your identity, smart mail can generate a shareable alias email that can be deleted at any time. Now, look, you know, the more and more these major corporations try to integrate your email addresses and all of your information to a service that's cleaner for you, the more that that information is going to be at risk to people. And smart mail protects you from those kinds of things. Those bigger service providers, they're just, it, it, it makes you a, more vulnerable to that information getting leaked out. So start securing your email privacy with smart mail. Sign up today and you'll get 50% off your first year. Go to smartmail.com slash majority. That's smart. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Start mail. Startmail.com slash majority. Uh, that's start mail with a T, not what I just said. S T A R T mail.com slash majority for 50% off your first uh, year. Start mail.com slash majority. Now, for this sponsor, my one of my best friends is a psychologist. And I was saying, look, I really need to, to get more into meditating because I'm on my phone too much. The synapses in my brain, they're getting fried. Headspace has been able to help me with that. Headspace is a scientifically proven app to help you manage your feelings and your mental health. In fact, a recent study proved in just two weeks, Headspace can reduce your stress by 14%. Once you download the Headspace app and try their mindfulness routines, it just takes a few minutes a day to change your relationship with stress and anxiety to start feeling better. Whether you want to relieve stress and anxiety, sleep better, or improve your focus, Headspace is your everyday dose of mindfulness for real life. So, I mean, I, I have the app downloaded. I need to be better about it. But when I was using it more consistently, I really felt that it had it helped my stress uh, levels get reduced a little bit. I was more grounded, less thinking about what the next thing I had to do would be, stressing about how I have to like get this done. I have to fix this thing in my apartment i've got to like save up for this etc it, it allows you to be in the present moment which is something that i struggle with um and so these kinds of apps 
it, it just makes it easy. It's on your phone. And Headspace in particular, I mean, it's, it's the best one. However you're feeling, try Headspace at headspace.com slash majority and get one month free off their entire mindfulness library. This is the best Headspace offer. So go to headspace.com slash majority today. Headspace.com slash majority. And lastly, we've heard about Grove here on this program. Now, Sam basically has talked about how Grove was huge for him in the pandemic in terms of getting all of his products. I've been using Grove as well. So at Grove Collaborative, they believe it's time to ditch single-use plastics for good. In fact, by 2025, Grove will be 100% plastic-free. Did you know that actually only 9% of plastic gets recycled no matter how much we put into our recycling bin? That's like, it pisses me off because I make an effort to recycle, specifically at home. But Grove can help you with that. From laundry care to hand soaps and more, Grove carries hundreds of products aimed at replacing single-use plastics across every room of your home and your head-to-toe personal care routine. Grove Collaborative's concentrated cleaners and refillable glass bottles are friendlier to the planet and twice as effective as the leading natural brands. Over 2 million households already rely on Grove Collaborative for safe formulas and refillable packaging that never compromise on performance. Go to grove.com slash majority today to get a free set worth up to $50 with your first order. Plus, shipping is fast and free. Get started right now at grove.com slash majority, grove.com slash majority. All right, folks, we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll be joined by Gina Dent. We are back and we are joined now by Gina Dent, Associate Professor of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, to discuss her recent book, Abolition, Feminism, now co-written by feminist scholars Angela Davis, Erica Miners, and Beth Ritchie. Uh, Thank you so much for being here, Gina. Thank you for having me on and for highlighting the book. I'm I'm excited to talk about it with you. Um, I guess let's start uh, more broadly, and then we can we can talk more specifics. You know, when I think people are familiar with the term feminism, right? Even though we've we've talked about the perils and pitfalls of white feminism and capitalist feminism on the show many times, so there's there's a broadness to that. But and abolition, though, is becoming a more uh, understood and accepted concept in our discourse. So yes. how how do you feel? In in your view, how are feminist and abolitionist strategies uh, inextricably linked? Yes, well, you know, it's so important now, and, and I'm glad you raised the point that abolition is part of our, uh, at least national and also international conversations now. And feminism, of course, has been with us for some time and is recognized and is still perceived as a threat. But the combination of abolition and feminism is what we're really focused on. And we're really focusing on the reasons why it's important to draw out the history of abolition work as feminist work, and also to highlight the idea that certain feminisms are not really the ones that we would want to align ourselves with because they are not abolitionist. So the book goes back and forth between addressing the history of abolition work, work against the prison industrial complex, and addressing feminisms that have not done the work of really looking at structural violence. So let's talk a little bit about the feminist, the the brands of feminism that have failed in this area. I, I think mm-hmm. it's easy to to identify it as you know 
in the lean in feminism, white feminism, right? Non uh, feminism that's not intersectional. But how would you describe it, um, it, uh, mm-hmm. in, in your terms, I guess? Sure. And, and they're the terms that we actually take from Elizabeth Bernstein, the author who first, first used this term, carceral feminism. And it, it sounds like a pretty difficult charge uh, to call someone a carceral feminist. Of course, no one identifies as a carceral feminist. It's a label given to those who have not fully thought through the implications of their feminism on those who are at the bottom of our social ladder, those who are affected the most by gender violence. And if we don't look intersectionally, if we're not looking at capitalism, if we're not looking at the prison industrial complex, then we're missing so many who really need our feminisms. And so the label carceral feminism is designed to point out the degrees to which feminist work can in fact bolster the prison industrial complex and leave us with more and more people inside and leave us less and less safe. Where do you trace carceral feminism back to, I guess, in U.S., uh, in the, within the context of United States uh, mass incarceration and imprisonment? Well, carceral feminism has been with us all along, but the height of it perhaps might be the 70s movement, the 80s, a uh, uh, time when people were trying to get attention to rape and to gender violence and where we started to measure the success of our movement in the number of years, for example, that someone might serve for a particular kind of harm or crime. And so the development of abolition feminism has always gone alongside this. And this is something we draw out in the book. There's always been a minoritized uh, history of abolition feminist work But carceral feminist work tends to get the label of feminism. It tends to be the one that people recognize as feminism. Right. And uh, that's because it's mainstreamed. uh, Mm -hmm. But it also, you know, when you mentioned the 70s and 80s, uh, Angela Davis, one of your co-writers, has always been at the forefront of prison Mm -hmm. abolition, has been imprisoned herself. How Mm -hmm. much did her personal experience um, help all of you in, in terms of crafting crafting this work? Yes. I mean, of the four of us, she's the only one who served time. Um, I should say that this work uh, by the four of us really extends back uh, almost 30 years to work that we've been doing together. And um, it's not just Angela's experience inside. It's actually all of the people that we collaborate with and have worked with over decades who are really leading this movement. It's really our role to lift those acts up, to lift those people up, to lift those ideas up. But this work has been done by those who have suffered the most. And our book tries to highlight um, many organizations and also individuals who have been engaged in this work because they were incarcerated, because they have family members who were incarcerated, because they live in communities that are affected so deeply by incarceration. So, uh, c- can you talk a bit about the the silencing of Black feminist uh, uh, liberationists and non uh, just again non mainstream feminists who are trying to mm-hmm. uh, present these topics as as intersectional? Like, what has mm-hmm. been your experience when trying to talk about uh, these topics broadly and connecting them as well, as opposed to siloing them? Yes, I think your your word siloing is really how I've experienced it. It's not always a, a full out silencing. In fact, some forms of inclusion in the mainstream feminist movement have been the most troubling. Uh, when we think about the origins of, for example, the Violence Against Women Act, when we think about the role of our first black woman senator, Carol Mosley Braun, in the um, crime bill um, of which VAWA is a part, um, we realize that the work of carceral feminism has also been the work of Black feminists sometimes because we are often from the communities that are most affected. So yes, uh, Black feminism has been sometimes marginalized. And even when it's lifted up, it can be a selective lifting up. It can be a selective reading of the literature and of the history. And so it's really important for us 
to ensure that we don't have to do the work of historical retrieval in, say, 30 or 50 years or leave that work to others who will survive us. But we really want now to focus on how much abolition feminist work has been key to pursuing the real forms of freedom that we are wanting to see. You mentioned the crime bill, and it's it's just, I mean, the ultimate example of the uh, bastardization of, I think, feminist language, the uh, the using the concept of protection uh, mm-hmm. in order to uphold systems of violence and mass incarceration. And I think that's what's so key to, to your work uh, or in, the, in this book mm-hmm. is to reframe it so people understand the state as a perpetrator of violence as That's well, um, which is uh, for, for our lawmakers, people like even our current president who crafted the crime bill, that mm-hmm. that is a, a complete, uh, maybe it, it's charitable to say that he doesn't, that he wouldn't understand that or our lawmakers wouldn't understand that more. It's, it's, a, it's a willing ignorance, I guess. Yes, I think it's an ignorance. It's also part of ceding to the political mainstream in various ways. Um, Tough on crime has been for the last several decades um, the way for people to get elected. It's only recently that actually moving against that has been something that people would do. Um, But I also think it's about not being able to follow the strategy that we label in the book as a both and strategy, a strategy that comes primarily from Black feminism, but also from other women of color feminisms, and also from feminisms that are attentive to class. And that both and means we simultaneously look at state violence and interpersonal violence. And any program, any policy, any law that doesn't address these simultaneously, or that bolsters the prison industrial complex under the guise of trying to give us protection, is for us a problem. And so you know, we need to be out there explaining how we can do uh, two things at once. And this is really a very difficult thing to say in the media. It's a very difficult thing to explain very quickly. It's not as easy to make a, a, a point, 10 point program to do this. And I think it's really important that we point out all of the different ways in which people have actually from the very beginning of the modern feminist movement that we've been discussing, been doing the work of trying to say that uh, our bolstering the prison industrial complex is not the way we want to treat the harms that happen to us and that the state has been a perpetrator from everything from um, searches in, um, in prison to unfair policing to the uh, family policing system, as uh, our scholar Dorothy Roberts calls uh, child protective services. And so there are many, many ways in which women in particular who are um, uh, placed in our society in such a way that they suffer from multiple um, kinds of violations um, need to be thought of and centered in order for us to get to the point where we can do both things at once. Okay. How... There's a there's a ret, uh, a retribution element to um or at least the veneer of retribution uh at, in these kinds of tough on crime laws like mm-hmm. specifically as it relates to violence uh, again or gendered violence violence against it's against women um mm-hmm. but in fact it's only an exacerbating force and sometimes women are disproportionately affected by it as well. Can you talk yes. about th- that impulse and how embedded it is right now in society, even though like it's obviously it, I think there's a me- many people understand that it is harmful uh, on the whole, but the impulse still remains. Yes. Uh, wh- what 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 do you identify as driving that? Well, there's so many things. I mean, the book references capitalism and and by this one, then not talking about the United States, the power and the force of the capitalist enterprise, which has uh, defined safety um, in a variety of ways and has made us um, impoverish our social um, uh, networks and our social supports. Um, is part of what uh, puts us in this position. There are also um, so many ways that we, especially in the United States, but of course many parts of the world, 
um, think only about our immediate family, our immediate context, what we know or have experienced. And for those who have not experienced incarceration, either themselves are, or in their families or in their communities, um, the perception is always that the people who are inside are the bad people, are the people who have done these incredible harms. But those of us who have been working on this issue for a very long time really understand the force of criminalization, the force of race um, and gender, and in the criminalization of so many of us. And so we need to focus on that. We need to focus on why we perceive some people as more dangerous than others. We see this, of course, when we're looking at police violence. We see this, of course, when we're looking at various ways in which communities are targeted. We, we look at so many different kinds of factors that affect criminalization. But that retribution is the thing that feels the easiest. It feels easy to say, someone harmed me, let me get back at them. However, the people who are talking about this are often not the people who have been so harmed. And it's one of the ways in which representation of these issues is really a problem. And it's something we also try to address in the book. And how does, you mentioned um, the the focus on interpersonal harm as opposed mm-hmm. to state harm. Mm-hmm. Um, how does the individualizing of violence in terms of the way that the state treats it, uh, how does that, I guess, um, that, a- that action exacerbate violence um, mm-hmm. yeah. as opposed to addressing it? Well, certainly. I mean, the individualization of violence and the individualization of everything that we're experiencing. We can, we're living in the era of COVID in which we uh, become so um, individually responsible for things. And there's so little community support and, and um, state support for what we're experiencing. And I'm not saying there aren't programs, but those programs tend to um, exacerbate the very same disparities that exist in society that we know are exacerbated when we're focusing on crime. And so one of the strategies that we speak about is the idea of disarticulating crime and punishment. In order for us to really understand the prison system and all of the damage it's done, we actually have to stop thinking about incarceration as a consequence of crime. Because in fact, so many people are imprisoned for reasons that are beyond their control. They could be innocent of the things they're charged with. They could be put in situations that make it impossible for them to thrive. And those situations are the ones that uh, provide the uh, main routes toward incarceration. And so for us, we need to separate out, disarticulate the discussion of crime from the discussion of punishment. Punishment in the form of incarceration has never done anything to rehabilitate. Um, I'm being a little strong there, and and I would say that some people who have served time have said even to us that the time that they served had an effect on their lives. But I do want to say if they were given certain resources in the free world that they were given inside, then they would also have experienced this transformation? In other words, what would it be like to have education before you're incarcerated? What would it be like to have health care before you're incarcerated? What would it be like to have um, drug treatment programs? We have internalized all of these functions to the system of incarceration, and those services are delivered inside in a way that is deeply uh, disturbing and brutal to those who are experiencing them even though they sometimes provide small benefits, we'd like to see those benefits um, provided in the free world so that people do not have to suffer inside. So, I mean, and, and I think, okay, may I ask in terms of how, you know, you're, you're, you're being broad, I guess, because abolition requires that in terms yes. of dismantling this, right? Is that a deliberate rhetorical strategy on your, on your part? Absolutely. I mean, The way that this plays out day to day is very local and very micro. But the way that we think about it for the book and for the work we do is always at the macro level. It's always broad. 
we have to think about the way in which incarceration is not only a practice inside the United States, and that wasn't necessarily originated in the United States, depending on which history you follow, but has been elaborated in the United States and spread across the world. We have to look at the way in which the various failures that we have in society, like healthcare, like um, schooling, are feeding the prison industrial complex. And so without paying attention to these things, we actually can't get to the problem of incarceration, and we certainly can't get toward abolition. And finally, I would say, as a feminist who's been concerned about gender violence for a very long time, that as much as I've been concerned about incarceration, we can't get to a place where we don't have harms if we are not attending to the true causes of those harms and trying to address them outside of a carceral environment. And the causes of those harms, again, as we as we laid out earlier, exacerbated by um, by a, a, a punitive system. But what's interesting, too, is you mentioned the crime bill, mm-hmm. how it almost seems deliberate, but how starkly feminism and um, punishment became interlinked during that time period, um, at least in the mainstream discourse, right? Uh, and in the way it was reflected in our in our political leg- legislation and laws and 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 uh, in, in mass incarceration, like I mean. How do you reckon with that time period, I guess, um, when when all of that rhetoric and then the legislation that followed was very much in vogue? Absolutely. And we haven't really outlived it. I mean, of course, we've seen a transformation. People fo- focus on 2020 as a massive transformation in the representation of many of these issues. Many of these questions that we've been speaking about for years, we could not speak about in mainstream media. We couldn't even use the term structural racism. We couldn't talk about um, uh, gender violence except in the context of wanting to incarcerate those that have been uh, the perpetrators of gender violence and harm. We couldn't talk about the state in these ways. And so these are things that are transforming. But of course, In the era of the 1990s, when we're talking about the development of the crime bill and VAWA, we're also talking about the attack on uh, welfare state, the other things that went along with the the dismantling um, of the social supports that so many people need. So it's not coincidental that more and more people are going into prison at the very same time that a lot of these issues are being discussed and that more harms are being created. We know, for example, that those who are prison guards, for example, um, tend to be around situations that trigger violence in them, um, that create more violence in communities, that the domestic violence statistics in communities that are um, that have uh, jails or prisons at their center um, go up. And so we understand that the prison and the jail itself, actually is a generator of gender harm, and we need to pay attention to these things. But it's very difficult to pay attention to them in an environment where we're all scrambling uh, to survive. Uh, And when we are now in an era where we talk regularly about multi-billionaires and their capacity to control more than our own nation states. We were just talking about that before you came on in terms of Amazon's infrastructure rivaling yes. that of this if not surpassing yes. that of our, of our state um and, and you touched on that uh, uh the the uh dissolving of social programs the the mm-hmm. rolling back of them that that was paired with our mass incarceration and i'm just wondering if you could expand on the concept of of care mm. being um, manipulated into now being incarceration. You, you, you yeah. talked about it a little bit in terms of how when the state gets involved in breaking up families, for example, which is often yeah. heavily racialized and, and has to do with uh, poverty as well. Uh, the, 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 the entire concept of state care is now just state punishment and incarceration. And that yeah. seemed to have happened quite rapidly all under the guise of feminism as well. Not all under it, but in terms of the, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we just, I just wanted to correct myself a bit, you know, um, that not all under it, but that was a, a small part. Alongside it, of yes, course. Yes, alongside it. 
Yes. I mean, you mentioned the term protection earlier, and it's, of course, a part of this discourse. Um, the invitation that we have um, to participate in systems that are criminalizing and that are creating further harms comes often because of this word pr protection or the word care. Um, protection is the word that's often used when we're talking about gender violence and we're talking about women um, and, and increasingly even trans um, folks and non-binary folks who are um, identified um, as um, those that need protection um, from the law and from the state. But what we're finding is that given that the prison system itself is a gendering institution and given that inside the violences can increase and in fact um, are perpetuated, then we need to try and understand why it is that the easy solutions that were that are proffered to us are the ones we should not accept. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to go against the impulses to use the system. Um, I was recently told about a case in the Bay Area, which we're going to try and begin to advertise. And um, a young girl um, was uh, killed after um, her family members were trying to make uh, it safe for her to live by removing her from the home of her mother, but also without criminalizing the mother and without um, having the child in uh, child protective services. And yet um, what ended up happening was that uh, the child was left in the situation where she was suffering, uh, but partly, partly because we have a kind of anxious way of both not wanting to um, intrude into other people's lives and at the same time provide protection under the guise of a state authority. And so we really need to start working on these other ways that are being developed all over the world of taking care of each other, of being with each other through these crises, and of not promoting additional uh, incarceration or the use of child protective services um, to treat these very serious problems. One thing I don't want to forget to say here is that we are all people who've been involved in some way or another with work against gender violence and against harm against children. We never want to see these harms um, increased. But we understand after studying this for many, many years and experiencing it ourselves that these systems are not well set up to support us, to protect us, or as you pointed out, to care for us. I, you mentioned the child protective services part of this, and I, I don't, I feel that we don't even talk about that enough because it's a, it's it's touchy, right? But yes. there is a, there is a paternalism and a. Uh, I, I, th there is a, a violent element, of course, to when the state gets involved often. And yes, sometimes there are cases that are uh, extreme and children are affected, but oftentimes it's the state punishing uh, people for their own poverty, which is a through line we see in America. But it's a particularly violent punishment. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your work in that area and your, your, your writing there. Yes, and I will point again, I think I mentioned Dorothy Roberts, and, and, and she's been working on this issue um, uh, in a number of ways, and she has a book that's um, just coming out. And her description of the system, actually, as a family policing system, was really key to our thinking about this issue. Unfortunately, there are many, many children who do need to be cared for better. but they're in environments and families where we also need more care. So how do we create environments in which people can thrive? How do we create an environment which heals the family, which heals the community, which gives the community enough resources, which gives the family enough resources so that the kinds of um, harms that we have identified are actually ones that are not going to be prominent in our environments. We're not so idealistic as to imagine that this will magically happen overnight. And one of the problems is trying to wean ourselves off of these systems when they're the only systems that we have. And part of this 
is a problem of state power and the law and the ways in which we all find ourselves constantly grappling with the legal limitations and the solutions that are proffered by the law, which is why they're also a focus in our book. So I, I guess we can turn a little bit more towards uh, how we how we move forward from here uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, there are restorative justice mm -hmm. pockets in this country. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, the concept of reform. We're seeing some of these in more progressive district attorneys uh, <laughs> getting elected, mm -hmm. but. You you argue that reform is you're, you're arguing for abolition of these systems as opposed mm -hmm. to reform. What is what's some of the hope that you see in that um, move towards reform in some areas of this country? Mm -hmm. uh, and what are some of the pitfalls you see of that being some of the focus of of many on the left? Yes, there's an organization called Critical Resistance that all of us have had some kind of affiliation to over the years and. Um, there's a chart in our book that Critical Resistance actually generated about the difference between reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms. Um, that's a, a distinction that actually came to us from Scandinavia. It's a longer story about um, the use of those terms. But to put it simply, we're looking at the reforms that helped us to decarcerate and move toward abolition as being the non-reformist reform. So we're not saying we're against changes. We're not saying we're against support for those who need it now. What we are saying is that we need to look at these reforms and make sure they are truly liberatory. So when we think, for example, back to what we've been speaking about, like VAWA, we, ne we need to understand that though that was perceived as a reform, and in fact, VAWA has been revised over the years since, in many ways to try to include, for example, indigenous um, <laughs> folks, to include trans folks, to include others who've been excluded. However, even with those inclusions, the proffering of this system as a solution is nonetheless a problem. And so we are really trying to focus also on all of the ways in which we can move toward, as you pointed out, restorative justice. There are several terms that are not retributive justice, not the punishment justice that we're so familiar with. There are um, transformative justice projects. There are ref um, restorative justice projects. The problem is that we can never simply understand what this project will do by the label. So there are many things that go by the term restorative justice that might be more in line with what we think of as a reformist reform. And there are also many things that go under that name restorative justice that are truly doing the work of moving us toward a society which does not incarcerate. We know as abolitionists that we won't get to a society that doesn't incarcerate just by opening up the gates and the walls. What we're trying to do is move toward a society where people know how to treat each other, where we take collective responsibility, where we look at the incredible wealth disparities and address them, where we address the other forms of disparity that we've been talking about. But we do this in a loving context. We do this in an abolition feminist context where we are all caring for each other. We are not just looking out for our own families or for ourselves. Uh, before I let you go, I have just one final question because you mentioned uh, the inclusion of indigenous people oh. in, in this, uh, of trans people mm -hmm. in, um, in, in this vision. And I mean, I think that's really important to emphasize given how those, uh, particularly in feminism, there's a whole group of feminists that want trans women excluded uh, yeah. from, from that idea. And indigenous people in this country have been excluded from larger, uh, almost every conversation about how we're going to make our systems more equitable and we'll abolish them altogether. So uh, if you don't mind just reiterating and expanding upon that, fo uh, uh, that, that em uh, emphasis that you made there, because I, I, th I do mm -hmm. think it's key. Absolutely. And it's part of the kinds of incorporation into state systems that we find so dangerous, but it comes from a motivation which is very important and we need to recognize. 
that gender is also a system which is making many people suffer. And of course, we know this from everything from Florida to you know other parts of the country where we're actually seeing legislation that is designed to bring more and more pain to those who are um, trying to live um, in a world in which um, we don't um, solidify the gender binary. But we also know, and this is something that's so important for me as a Black woman to raise, that the rate of incarceration of Indigenous folks in this country is um, higher than the rate for Black people. And so much of the conversation that we have is exclusively about um, jails and state facilities. But when we talk about jails in Indian country or federal prisons, we're bringing in a, an entirely other group of people that we really need to attend to. And so we want to attend, again, to the harms that are happening to all of these people, but not by incorporating um, more and more people into the framework of VAWA or the punishment system. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time. Gina Dent, Associate Professor of Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, co-author of Abolition Feminism Now, uh, Angela Davis, Erica Miners, Beth Ritchie, the other authors of this uh, great work. Thank you so much for your time today, Gina. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. All right, folks, with that, we are going to say goodbye to the first hour of this program, and we're going to head into the fun half, where we'll be taking your calls, doing some clips, making fun of Tucker Carlson's uh, homoerotic documentary series, potentially. Tucker had a busy week. Oh, yeah. He has a few docs coming out for Tucker Carlson originals. So oh, they were. Yeah, that's that, that's what it is, right? It's like doc. his like little studio, you know? Yeah, I mean, I wonder how Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire feel about him encroaching on their cinematic universe. With the original content. I know, right? Enough. Daily Wire wants a monopoly, but there's just there's too many too many competitors here. Uh we'll we'll be taking your call, six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. But first, Matt, what's happening this week in Left Reckoning? Yeah, on Left Reckoning for patrons, we had Lillian Chichurkia of the What's Left of Philosophy podcast on to talk about an interesting article she wrote, uh, which is actually a review of a, a book on Marx and his relationship with liberal rights. And uh, Lillian argues that liberal rights are not something that we should thank capitalism for. Uh, and that they uh, were one often in spite of capitalist power. Um, so, and it's also um, a reason that the left should take things like free speech and that stuff seriously, and not just a, a sort of um, outgrow uh, bourgeois uh, right, but something um, that it actually de de delivers for workers. So, uh, check that out. patreoncom slash reckoning. There's a teaser on the uh, on the podcast feed if you want about five six minutes of it. And uh, can I do a brief plug? what yes. it's just because i was on gregory from oklahoma show a few oh, weeks ago yeah. and the episode just came out so uh if you guys want to check out the green corn rebellion show i was on that we talked for a really long time just about like our upbringings and some fun stuff and also um obviously our shared love of new metal so check it out green corn rebellion check it out gregory from oklahoma i see you there bradley look at that what hat did you break out for that one Oh, it's just like a like a, I got it for Christmas. It's just like a fun little uh, hat that's, that's like has a little uh, red string around it. It's kind of like my my going out hat. Okay, my, uh, gotcha. My party hat. Yeah, I'm always you know I'm envious. I should I should just wear a hat on the show one day because I you do should. I wear them a good amount. Like when my hair is messy and I don't do anything with it, but um you know I want people to see that side of me. All right, we're gonna head into the fun half six four six two five seven three nine twenty. Bye bye. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Fun hat. Matt! Do fun hat. What is up, everyone? Fun hat. No me key. You did it! Fun hat. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hat. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. Everyone, I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop.
talking oh, wow. for a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight. Yes. on your mind sports we can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism oh, i'm gonna go start off who libertarians they're so stupid though common sense says of course gobbledygook we fucking nailed him so what's 79 plus 21 challenge man i'm positively quivering i believe 96 i want to say 857 210 35 501 one half three eights 11 for instance $3,400, dollars 1900 $3 trillion sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire, Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Um, Two o'clock, we're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. We are back. We are back. And we're drinking at 1 p.m. on a Monday. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a bit of an issue. I uh, Wait, I can't hear you. No, it's this is my cord. So just keep talking. Emma's having a cord I have, issue. I have an issue, yeah. Yeah, I went, I went uh, to Long Island for a friend's birthday for some wine tastings, and I was just, like, drunk at 9 a.m. Oh. Like, 9 a.m.? Yeah, like, we, were, we went out really early, and a like, guy started drinking, like, at 9 a.m., which was, like, it felt a little bit too... That is too comfortable. Really yeah. So I, I ended up then, I ended up then sleeping from 7 p.m. to midnight. <laughs> After you were telling me that. Yeah, you got so, home. So my circadian rhythm is just completely out of whack. So this probably won't, won't be too bad. It's just one beer. Yeah, no, uh, I can't hear. So this is going to be an issue. Uh, we might want to take a look. You want to go to break? We might need to take yeah. a break. All right, yeah. One second, guys. Sorry, guys. One second. <laughs> We are back. Okay. My cord is working again. Yep. Ta talking to it, Bradley, again? Or are you going to? No, no. Do your. Uh... Crack, crack, crack that open, it. Matt. Crack it. Ooh, that's ASMR. Nice. There we go. ASMR. AS majority. Emma's brought us in some uh, Coney Island mermaid pilsners. Yes. I'm always a pilsner fan. So thank you, Emma. That, so that's literally why I got it. Bradley, uh, I knew that you would drink anything so <laughs> you bring gasoline in here I'll probably... <laughs> yeah. but uh matt was more particular about the pilsner so i went with that i'm going with a white claw today 
I don't, it's hard for me to drink a, a beer, uh, a heavy beer, and then, like, I have to go out to dinner tonight for my birthday. I don't want to, like, get, I'll get tired. This, this, like, this keeps me a little bit more, more awake. I can't believe 9 a.m. you were doing wine testing that early. Yeah, I mean, I was drinking Hennessy at 9 a.m. And then we got to the wine. Really? We, we got to the we got to the wine. That's like winery. me in college. We got to the winery around around noon, which I kept going. Uh, and yeah, so I was, and like I said, yeah, you know, I was I was really I was really in the throes of it. Yeah, the thing I heard about wineries is they love when you pregame. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I don't That's worry. the I exact finished... setting for like <laughs> vomiting in the I bushes. I finished that bottle. Don't worry, I finished the bottle on the bus. I didn't bring it in. I don't think they were gonna allow open carry in there. <laughs> Probably drinking Hennessy on a bus on Saturday is really straight into Long Island. Yeah, uh, at a certain point, yeah. I, I, over the weekend, we went to a brewery as well, uh, and then it turned into like a mix of a wine, and then someone gave me a tequila shot. So I definitely did my fair share over the weekend. But the, today's the actual day, so that's that's why we gotta we gotta uh, have the white claw. Yikes! All right, let's take a call. <laughs> Calling from a 308. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 308 number. This is Kowalski from There Nebraska. we are. And if I am not mistaken, isn't it somebody's birthday today? Yes, I'm making a uncomfortably big deal about it. <laughs> well, it is a big deal because it's your birthday and you're a big deal. Thank so you. happy birthday. Thank you. You're a big deal too, Kowalski. That is overselling it. I'm a blip. That's it. No, you're actually like six five. Anywho, like yeah, I, I I remember you were bragging about how tall you were and how how you're just the Tinder swindler because of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I honestly almost forgot about that. Was funny. Um, <laughs> but the reason I am calling in has to do with some ag related news, and I was curious if you guys had anybody in the upcoming roster to talk about the fertilizer and food situation i don't think so do we have somebody coming up i would highly recommend getting a professional to uh like to interview because some of the reports i've been reading i misunderstood some of the data and after re-examining it and listening to a few people that i do kind of trust on this stuff it it is looking like a total catastrophe uh, one who is usually a bit pessimistic but has been pretty much accurate over the last three years is thinking somewhere along the lines of food insecurity for at least 2 billion people by December. Mm-hmm. And by that, it's like governments rationing food insecurity, mostly in probably the Middle East, possibly Sub-Saharan Africa, but South Asia, China in particular will be in a very precarious position. Jesus. So, yeah, it's uh, the problem for China is that they are a massive food importer. A lot of disruptions, especially with fertilizer. It's just not looking good. Brazil is a massive food exporter and has pretty much no domestic fertilizer production. So the whole situation is a catastrophe. And I am sure that there are some professionals out there that would be able to speak better about that. And yeah, it is not looking good. Okay. So we got to have a guest on to talk about fertilizer scarcity. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll chat you, with Brendan. If you see one. Uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Email, email. And if you have, if you have a good suggestion, Kowalski or call back, obviously. I'll look around, but uh, there's, usually just some people at universities that you could also there is some feedback when i'm speaking so i don't know if that's on your guys' end or whatever but should be fixed now thanks all righty but better uh, now that was pretty much it i just figured without the you know doomer boomer cedar on that you guys needed a little more doom yeah so. thank you Thank you for filling our doom quotient. And bright news, the Western Hemisphere will be fine, but uh, everyone else probably pretty bad. So, grow gardens, grow gardens, do what you can. That's it. Happy birthday. Thank you. Drink a lot. I think it helps with the uh, with the doom. So. It, uh, it, it, it momentarily does help from the uh, crushing dread of our climate hurtling towards unlivability and uh, mass death coming around soon. I think the nukes will get us before the climate. Don't worry about climate, but 
At least Everyone at least the nukes would be quick. At least I'd die quickly. Hopefully. You guys will. New York is a prime target, unfortunately. You're right. Radiation. Yeah. I mean, you're right. You're you right. See, just another benefit of you big city folks with your underground <laughs> trains and all the restaurants you could ever hope for. Well, with that, I will leave you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Kowalski. Thank you for the kind message. Dave from Jamaica. I generally agree with guests, but issues uh, I have are the cell. I just don't see a path. When I talk to people around me, uh, they need to save fa- the need to save face or get revenge is so strong. Is there a way to talk? regular folks about this as effective i think you know there's a boldness to the uh the broadness with which she discusses this that is like mirrored by angela davis has been on this for her whole career um and it it, it, you can people are going to be upset with like the lack of lack of practicality as they perceive it but as academics their role is like a lot more about creating a vision that is something to be stri- uh, to strive for as opposed to like policy wonkishness that I think can be more reflected in legislation. Yeah. And I also think it, it makes sense from just a, a wanting this stuff to stop and having an uh, awareness of what we've been doing and how it hasn't been working. Yeah. Right. Like America literally is the number one human cager on planet earth. It jails black people disproportionately high at higher rates than apartheid South Africa. Um, we're doing all of this incarceration and it is not solving the problems and it's just leading to demands for more of it. Like I, I think at a certain point, like this is everyone knows that Einstein quote. Like it's the most famous Einstein quote. I think it's probably um, not actually by Einstein. I don't know, but that um the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting yes. something different to happen. And it's like, how many more people do we need to arrest? Exactly. Lots of happy birthday messages from people. Thank you, Alina, VV, DNC, Google Pundit, Dr. Jackal- Jackson Hinkelson, PhD, um, et cetera. Between the one and one and the five, Alex Jones' new show should be called Jonestown. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> A nightmare Sebe Day rotation in honor of Emma's birthday. I've gone vegan and used the entirety of my pay- paycheck to bet on sports ball. That sounds like a wise choice. Uh, not actually. Dank Uger. Wasn't the uh, Amazon owned airline doing those pretty disturbing ICE deportation flights? They weren't owned. Oh, yes. They were owned by them. We covered that on the show. Yes. Uh, if they wanted to balance that conversation in terms of. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, maybe that's what they mean. Uh, he means by helping with immigration. Good point, Dank Uger. Nightmare Sebi Day rotation. I'm late, but in regards to the Amazon clip, if they wanted to balance the conversation in terms of salary, they would need between six thousand to seven thousand entry level workers to present their side. Also, um, I don't want uh, Amazon anywhere near immigration policy in this yeah. country because there's a great, very great chance that all they do is end up like having cages for immigrants where they have to work like 18 hours a day and be like, Hey, it's better than nothing. Yeah. You're, we're not, you know, deporting you in a bound, uh, like straight jacket and sending you <laughs> back home. Like that was what the story was coming out of the intercept. Right. From a few months ago, truck nuts, 420. Perhaps if men would take a break from patting themselves on the back for winning a race, women weren't not even allowed to run in. They would hear the innumerable amount of stories and cases of sexism and trans misogyny in athletic competitions, or, you know, at least watch Bend It Like Beckham or something. This is old news. Catch up, bros. Bend It Like Beckham. That was a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, I I remember that was the first I ever heard of David Beckham. And because I I just didn't follow soccer at all. And it was very strange to like be presented with an athlete who was supposedly like a Michael Jordan type. It's like, well, I've never heard of Right, exactly. (laughs) Uh, That was also just like uh, when uh, the world fell in love with Kira Knightley. So there's that. Oh, she's in Bennett like Beckham. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The cool thing about Beckham, though, is... I fell in love with her during that movie. <laughs> yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, yeah, that was Yes, my... it was ridiculous. But, but That's why like... I fell in love with Orlando Bloom. Mm. I had a lifestyle. Damn, I had a cardboard cut out of him. I don't it's, know. Uh, he married to Katy Perry. Katy Perry, yeah. Well, good for you. Yeah. All right. Anyway, let's uh, let's do a clip, shall we? Let's start with this Tucker thing. Which one do we want to start oh, with? Oh, yeah. Which, which the, Tucker one? The, the trailer. The trailer. Yeah, right, right. 
Here is Tucker Carlson's new trailer for a documentary special that he is uh, putting forth. It's about how testosterone is declining in men. And now apparently there are some studies about how like due to or health or increase in obesity that there's a slight decline in testosterone in men. But or maybe some pollutants or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Just there, like, like lack of environmental regulations probably causing such things. Even right. though, I mean, the, the this is not there's nothing dire about this but he wants to present this as like look at china they're all masculine they treat their men like men and their armies are so stacked with real men and here we're debating trans issues um but frankly i haven't seen something this homoerotic and uh, since the top gun volleyball scene let's take a look He has risen. Do we have theories for what that is? Uh, we will. I will tell you once okay. this is. Uh, apparently, it's a uh, tanning of your testicles. Uh, is that uh, butt sunning? It, it's it's like the the right wing equivalent of the uh, what 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 was the t phrase of when your your butthole gets sun? Butt sunning, I think. That's what it's called. I think so. That's what I heard it does. Okay, but that was more like spiritual, like guru stuff. Yeah. This tanning of your testicles is supposed to uh, increase your testosterone levels, I guess, by getting vitamin D there. <laughs> can we start it over? Yeah, we can. <laughs> vitamin D for the testicles. Get it? <laughs> The cow yeah. Once a society collapses, then you're in hard times. Well, hard iron sharpens iron, as they say, and those hard times inevitably produce men who are tough, men who are resourceful, men who are strong enough to oh, just drinking eggs. And then they go on to Pause the it. order. I'm sorry. And so the cycle begins. So this is just uh, like a rocky training sequence. You're talking over the important thing though where he says I'm that sorry. These, these hard men reestablish order. Right. Men who are tough, men who are resourceful, men who are strong enough to survive. And then they go on to re-establish order, and so the cycle begins again. Re-establish order. So, like, it is homoerotic, but it's also fascist. Well, there's no, yeah, oh, exactly, precisely. There's, <laughs> yeah. there's nothing to worry about then. Like, the hard times are going to create a whole bunch of, like, um, egg drinking, cow milking, Uber men, mm -hmm. and they're going to re-establish order or capitalism. Um, as it, you know, <laughs> it people go hungry as supply chains can't meet the demands. Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty fascinating. I, I can't wait to, when's that documentary out? Do we know? We don't know, but, um, we do have that, we do have a clip, uh, specifically in reference to the testicle tanning. That might've been a little, little bit of a preview. Yes. Just in case people were unaware of what that device is, where is that device sold in places? Maybe we should get one for, is that an Elon Musk thing? I don't know. I mean, again, like, I think that this uh, is Tucker Carlson's attempt to m more uh, mainstream or shave off some of the Joe Rogan bro science people who are constantly feeling like their masculinity is under some sort of biological threat. That's why you need to drink, you know, uh, bull testicle juice. That's why you need all these supplements. That's why you can't get vaccinated. That's why you're going to be feminized by soy all of these things is like it's like this constant anxiety of the atomized white man who feels like their testosterone is under threat. Yeah. Plus, trans people scary. It's been a while since I've been on Tinder, but I wonder how the guys that say I suntan my testicles, they put that on their profile. If that like really, really is a success for them. All right. Here's uh, here's an example of that. You saw in the clip there. Um, if you want to optimize and take it. 
uh, to another level, expose yourself to red light therapy. Yes. Um, and the juve um, that we were using in the documentary. There's a massive amount Which of that. testicle tanning. It's testicle tanning, but it's also full body uh, red light therapy. Uh -huh. which has massive amount of benefits. It's funny how he'd rather emphasize the full body thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just the testicles, dude. It's not just the pointing lasers that are nuts. We do a whole lot of other stuff, too. It's totally scientific. Also, the red light therapy is what, like, the Kardashians use to stay young. So uh, you're, you guys are basically just female influencers, but keep going. Uh, red light therapy, uh -huh. which has massive amount of benefits. And there's so much data out there um, that isn't being picked up on or covered. So obviously half the viewers right now are like, what? That's testicle tanning? That's crazy. But my view is, okay, testosterone levels like crash and nobody says anything about it. That's crazy. So why is it crazy to seek solutions? It's not crazy to seek solutions. And I think um, I was recently exposed to a term called bromeopathy, and I think there's a lot of people out there right now that um, <laughs> bromeopathy. Are... Bromeopathy. Mm -hmm. Just to catch people up, homeopathy is a sort of branch of pseudoscientific quackery, where it's like, hey, if you've been poisoned, the solution to that poisoning is a very small amount of that same poisoning diluted <laughs> to like a millionth to the percentile. <laughs> homeopathy that's homeopathy really yeah that's homeopathy yeah. i thought it was more just like take this you know vitamin supplement and you're gonna feel better no the fundamental thing behind homeopathy is like like cures like so it, it goes back to like the 19th century like it, i mean hair of the dog is an actual example that works but <laughs> say like um uh, you have COVID. We just need to give you a little bit of COVID in this oh. uh, thing like that. But it, um, it, it it's been diluted into different, ironically, into different types of uh, pseudoscience. But bromeopathy. I mean, okay, sorry. Let's. Yeah, uh, but it just makes it more masculine. Let's take this last ten seconds again. Why is it crazy to seek solutions? It's not crazy to seek solutions, and I think. Um, I was recently exposed to a term called bromeopathy, and I think there's a lot of people out there right now that, um are don't trust the mainstream information and they're taking yeah so uh here's a, a product that i might or uh i may or may not have a personal stake in putting onto the market might i would imagine that he's really cornered the market on uh, testicle tanning services so uh here's how you can be more like a man pay 699 dollars and you'll be able to restore your testosterone now, like, I don't know what the actual, and maybe we have people in the sci scientific background that can look up studies on this. Um, I'm looking at a men's health <laughs> um, <laughs> article, and it's it's titled, I put a giant red light on my balls <laughs> and tripled my testosterone levels. <laughs> 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 and it's like, I just don't understand, like, okay, but to what end did you triple your testosterone? What do you do with a triple testosterone level? Even if we grant that this is an accurate thing, like, I just... He's I, like, my penis grew by like four times the size it was before. If that was the case, then you're going to see a whole a run of these red light things. But like, that's the thing is it doesn't translate like that. Like, what is it? What do you do with that extra? Like, oh, I just felt so fucking like, oh manly. My gosh, I'm, I'm really watching the fucking Timberwolves game today because <laughs> I, I have been uh, my nuts are completely like <laughs> dark now. <laughs> I. This is very strange, but anyway, I'm glad Tucker. This is this is that is you're right about what Tucker's doing though. It's just yeah these sort of lost men, who I mean, man, love Jordan are, Peterson, love exactly. Joe Rogan. He sees an he sees an untapped market, and the way that he weirdly he has like an entrepreneurial mind in terms of like the people that he targets. He was ahead of the curve on vaccines, where the rest of the conservative movement was not in terms of how he can tap into like those kinds of folks. And he's ahead of the curve on the uh, insecure man that wants to make sure that his testicles have a light pink hue like they were in the sun for a little while. You know, you've got to get some color if you want to get a girl. <laughs> and look, I, I Color get, down there. <laughs> I, I, I get, like, the desire to be motivated and, like, physical uh, um, ambition. That's good. Like, I, I, I was so into basketball this weekend that I was doing uh, more push-ups uh, than I typically <laughs> do. Just watching it, just being like, I need to be more like Anthony Edwards. But I understand that there's a limit to that. And, like, I guess these guys can't watch basketball because it's too woke or whatever. Um, man, you need a better outlet than drinking, force, forcing yourself to swallow eggs and, you know, I guess tanning your nuts. Yeah, it's just, like, really difficult when 
the entirety of media culture doesn't center you as your own like individual identity as a white man so you've got to do all these things that like you know i that uh female influencers and models do essentially like that's what this is what this market is it's a way women have been told to feel insecure about how they look for for you know decades at this point and here's how you're gonna you're gonna buy this corset to to make you pass out but you're gonna look really skinny and now you're gonna use botox and fillers to make yourself look a certain way but now men get to feel insecure too so here's how you can tan your ball sack yeah the cosmetics of like trying to get men to do makeup and stuff like that didn't quite work but now we can sell them laser beams so they can point at their testicles so Oof. just stick your balls in a microwave and you can probably save some money if you're interested, guy in looks like product. a total nerd um, out there in the desert doing his pose to like uh, what was it, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do do link call uh homeopathy is not quackery. I've studied and used it very successfully. I'm a registered nurse and was skeptical, but. It resolved issues MDs couldn't. My first homeopath was also an MD and knew what it was to use homeopathy versus allopathy. You're wrong, Matt. India and UK and Central America use it extensively. They are nas- there are naysayers and quack fighters that promote your view. There is pl- There are plenty of scientific resources. Please get educated. Uh, I don't believe you, but uh, that's one perspective. And uh, if more perspectives like that come in, maybe I'll reassess my position. But uh, that's not enough for me to make me do it. Raw from Dedham. Blue balls are for weak men. Tan balls are for real men. Uh, M- Michael from Bavaria. Testicular skin cancer it will be the new right wing trend. <laughs> Slappy Dub. Strange that a white supremacist like Tucker Carlson is interested in darkening his nutsack. <laughs> Josh from Tucson. Oh wait, look, he runs a CrossFit gym called Marjorie Taylor. Call Marjorie Taylor Green. Yeah, CrossFit's like a uh, uh, fascist pipeline. <laughs> it, so it really is say like. It. It's like the, uh, it is, I mean, it's not quite as developed maybe, but like it's preying on the same sort of loss of meaning. Yeah. <laughs> like that sort of thing. Right, right. Here's, here's a community like The way the you. Nazis used to have like, um, like here's communal workout time or something like that. Like, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, they're, they're not as close to where Barstool is in terms of making the pipeline, but soon enough. Nug Wrangler, happy birthday, Emma. Gifted some paid subscriptions on Twitch there for, by indirectly giving you birthday money for sports betting. Thank you so much. Affluence, I don't know if that's really how it works, but I appreciate it anyway. Affluence and wretchedness. You've unlocked memories of my early 2000s queer girl experience of be- watching Bendit like Beckham in Pleasantville at sleepovers and desperately trying to play it cool. Happy birthday, Emma. I mean, honestly, uh, uh, Kira Knightley makes it difficult. Space case. Happy birthday, Emma. Conservatives are always trying new issues, uh, tying new issues back to the old issues. In regards to Tucker's documentary, if hard societies breed tough males, what exactly is their solution? Oh, right. Destroy the social safety net. Yeah. Robo Gorka. I use the red lasers to cancel out all the blue chew I eat from my limp. (laughs) Okay. All right. Andrew and Olympia. If Tucker is worried about the disappearance of masculinity, he could have saved a lot of production money by visiting a bathhouse on Bear Night. Happy birthday, Emma. I'm glad you exist. Thank you so much. It'd be so funny to see Tucker tanning his nuts. Demian says, no, homeopathy is quackery. Oh, so we have a bit of a... I mean, that's where I'm at. I, I, I've seen quite a lot of back and forth on that, and I'm just not uh, convinced by those arguments. I literally, I just forgot my boyfriend was telling me about the South Park episode this morning. Randy testicles. Man, that guy reminded me of Randy Marsh in South Park. He actually put his testicles in an oven and said he wants to get a little bit of cancer so he could get medical marijuana. (laughs) That episode, like, like, like visually is so grotesque. (laughs) Like when his balls, he's like, he can, his balls are so big he can sit on them. Oh yes, it, I've seen them. It, it I, I nasty. Like, what, there's also that episode where like they lose internet too, and that's like lots of really vulgar imagery of Randy uh, coming out of South Park. I'm not the biggest South Park fan, but I know people really love it. Was this Sasha Baron Cohen's thing where he um, interviewed the guy where he was having his nuts stretched, or am I? I don't remember that. Okay, I, can... I do remember. Uh, watching at age 10 an episode of um 
the Ali G show with my dad and there was a just that was I think the but well I'm over <laughs> I'm oversharing but there was a lot of new it was the first time I'd seen some that kind of nudity before is my point oh oversharing calling from a 702 number who's this where you call from <laughs> hello it's bro flamingo from las vegas hey bro bro flamingo how's it going what's going on emma happy birthday by the way thank you so much um well you guys brought yeah it is emma's birthday but um i was gonna say uh you guys brought up uh, alex jones earlier I feel like, you know, with him going through bankruptcy, whatever, I feel like a lot of people are just stealing his juice and, you know, and just running with it, like Tucker and all that stuff. I remember I remember when uh, Alex Jones was ranting about gay frauds and masculinity. Remember yep. all that stuff? And yep. now it seems, like, it seems like everybody is just – be quiet, guys. But it seems like every guy, like everybody on the right is just following that grift, you know? So it's very interesting just seeing how, like, you know, Alex Jones was like the grandfather, all that stuff, and everybody's just running with it. But – um. Uh, the one, the one thing I really wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, you had no Mickey on the other day. You had no Mickey on the, and shout out to no Mickey. Uh, you know, she brought some really good points, and I felt like it was a long time coming for people to kind of call out. Like, I, I, listen, I don't want to talk about crystal ball and all that stuff, but I do feel like there's like a certain segment of the left now, and, and what you want to call the anti-imperialist left, or you know, kind of like the anti-woke left. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I think, think anti woke left is better. Uh, in uh, F A, I think a del- uh, sorry to cut you off, Bro Flamingo, but it can be characterized no, as a deliberate, um, you know, a, a deliberate I think pivot away from like say I think our show's done a really good job of focusing on trans issues. Uh, there's that's less of that focus, and because it's alienating to certain like uh, Joe Rogan bro types. Plus, uh, anti-AOC rhetoric also overlaps with that same audience. And on the foreign policy stuff, I would use a term like uh, campus as opposed to anti-imperialist. But I get what you're saying. Yeah. Right. No, precisely. And and, and, I, and it's so – here's another thing. Again, so I even get like a vibe from these people where it, it's like, you know, again, we're going to need like a multi-racial labor coalition, just a multi-racial coalition in general. But I, I feel like these – Anti woke top, this anti woke leftist or populist, wherever you want to call them, you know, very off putting to me as, as a person of color. You know, I, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, I know they're kind of popular, but I, I feel like, you know, they're very class reductionist. Yeah. I feel like, you know, I, I feel like a lot of it is a branding exercise. Like, oh, what politician today is going to, rest in peace, Michael Brooks, you know, you have to go hard on systems, not people, certain people you do, but mostly on systems. And I feel like it's like, like to you guys, to you guys point, Nomiki's point where a lot of it's like a branding exercise. It, it, and again, I feel like, you know, especially people in color or, or even women, by the way, you know, the anti-woke stuff, I, it's a branding exercise because when I, when I meet leftists in, in real life, or whatever, I don't hear any of this garbage. It, maybe, maybe it's too online. Maybe, you know, it's one of those things that, that, that stay online, but I, I do feel like for some reason, I, it, it poisons the well so badly for our movement and what we want to do. I agree. And, um, and I'll say this too, oh, like sorry. there is a, there, there's a, I think, um, an internal battle that I deal with sometimes where it's like, I want to be the most of most people that watch political leftist media are men. And it's fairly overwhelming in terms of the, the analytics. And so that's why, um, Interesting. yeah, it's, it's, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but like 80, 20, Upper 80. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's very, it's very highly concentrated in terms of those demographics, um, with men. And so there is a, there is a push for women in particular to, uh, be the cool girl. Right. And trans issues, right. some men are uncomfortable with that. Right. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm like not woke. I'm not going to make you feel uncomfortable by bringing up some of these issues that are social, right? Let's just make it about, uh, let's not be intersectional. Let's not be alienating. I'm going to cater to a certain segment of like white male viewership. And, um, I feel like I felt that pressure early in my career and I've decided mm. to not <laughs> go down that road because it's it's one that's just intellectually dishonest, and I think you know you have to be intersectional and really militant about that. And two, um, there are other people filling that void uh, on the internet, and and I, I I find it a little icky. So, and you know, my, my my last point, I'll jump. You know, into that point, there's 
it, it's so strange to me because you want to appeal to these bro types. And again, it's not really a hot take, just my opinion. You're shadowing the line between like alt light and like that, that type of stuff. Why not just reach out to people who are just not political at all? Why, why do we have to force ourselves, or not force, but people are trying to force, like, man, you, we have to appeal to these anti woke, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very false, false dichotomy to me. But I all, but, and there's a, there's a part of me, again, I'm going to be charitable, but there's a part of me that's like, you, 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 the grift is in. Like, you know, this is target rich audience here. You, you know, you, yeah. this isn't really about politics. You, you just need that audience. You get what I'm saying? It's the, just like the reason you. I don't know. I, I, yeah, no. The reason you appeal to an anti woke, uh, so called like YouTube audience is because they're already a YouTube audience, yeah. as opposed to the people you're talking right. about who aren't on YouTube yet. And it would not only would you need to get them to subscribe to your politics, but you need to get them to be an active uh, user of YouTube so they could um, draw some revenue towards them. <laughs> And also, Matt, to your point, you actually have to do some political organizing, which a lot of these brand exercises are actually very adverse to. Anyway, guys, love you. Have a great birthday, Emma, and have a, have a great day, Matt. And take care, Bradley. Best is best. Thanks so much, Bro Flamingo. Good to hear from you. What's kind of scary about the masculinity stuff to me is that this seems this does seem cyclical to like the thing that was said in the trailer that. Like this was going on in Teddy Roosevelt times too. A lot of like Teddy Roosevelt's whole public persona of like the hunter and that mm. sort of stuff was geared toward this exact same anxiety. And it was also in part driven by advancements of LGBT people. Like you look at what was going on with like and Oscar also Wilde and stuff suffrage, like that. right? Exactly that too. And so it's like Matt, like the and it it is they're they're returning to it because it's tried and true. Now I don't know if they're going to be able to get the same kind of run out of it that patriarchal movements that you look at the way progressive movements slowly turn into sort of social democratic, but patriarchal movements, um, uh, uh, like sort of during the new deal and post new deal era. Um, hopefully there's not as much, um, testosterone in that, uh, <laughs> system this time. And it's, it's a little bit, um, weaker, but. Right. All right. Let's, um, speaking of testosterone, do we want to do this? Oh, Trump let's do this Trump before? video. Yeah. So here's Trump. Uh, no tie. Yeah. Right. Well. Oh, that is odd, right? I mean, it'll. It seeing him in a t-shirt might, if that ever happened, that might like actually get the like have the world. I fall can't off imagine of his, his access. Arms. Uh, I don't. I don't want to imagine his arms. Well, he plays sometimes with the white collared shirt golfing, but it's always a collar. Like I've. Ne I don't think. I don't know if I've ever seen him in a in a, like. Uh, something on his torso that was collarless it, it's it's almost as jarring as when sam zoomed into the show on friday with a t-shirt on well, you know but it's just that this is this is unnatural a, a guest on his own show right on, <laughs> yeah i mean how far he's fallen anyway uh so here's trump he was caught on camera talking to roger stone and roger stone if you can catch him towards the end of this video he refers to ron DeSantis as a piece of shit and uh trump seems to agree and turns around. Roger! <laughs> Roger! How could I not see He's a piece of shit. He just goes, we'll Ron go DeSantis is a piece of shit. Yeah. That's, that's the first Let's go he back says. a little bit. He says, God bless you. And then Ron DeSantis is a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, by the way, just <laughs> speaking of. Like, let's cut to the chase here. Okay, just actually, let's watch it again. And Trump is, yeah, he's a little bit like, look, Roger, I know. I know, I know. You've been texting I get me it, that. Roger. You've texted me that like 45 times in the past five weeks. So it's interesting because we're still awaiting what uh, Trump's decision is going to be in 2024. Yeah, I mean, what does that look like other than maybe Roger Stone is looking out for his boy Trump oh, yeah. and saying, DeSantis is moving against you, buddy. You better you know, like figure out something to uh, uh, head off this challenge. Yeah, I mean, I have a, I kind of still, as of now, feel like, although I think everyone else will clear a path, I almost feel like DeSantis is the only one who may 
actually be like, I don't care, I'll do it. Like, I'll. Run. Well, he's, he's laid like sufficient groundwork right. for an actual run. I think it will end badly for him if Trump enters the race. Yeah, because I think Trump also will just then go like total scorched earth. Like he is no, like he doesn't, he doesn't care. He's not going to be like nice to this guy. He'll just fucking, he'll just fucking ruin him or try or do his best to do. I mean, how, what the wealth of material? Look at that campaign ad you ran, uh, uh, reading your book to uh, your kids. You're like totally just a mini me. Mini me, Ron. Well, that's Mini the thing, Ron. right? You can basically just say you're not a real, like you're you're just doing my thing. Yeah, like, everybody knows who the real alpha is. You here. want the raw deal? You want the raw shit? Yeah, I mean, exactly, right? Like, uh, the like to to these uh MAGA heads, Ron DeSantis is like coke that's cut with baby powder, and uh, Trump is the coke that comes a- straight from uh, like the I don't even know how it's Trump harvested. is Trump is like the Mexican coke bottle with like the, you know 100 percent cane sugar like the like the like the distilled like be like sweet flavor like no Trump is the coke that his son uses yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that <laughs> the good stuff shit. right can we uh, let's watch this uh, Vic Berger clip of uh, DeSantis oh I um, love this because he really wants to be Trump. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't trust the premise of the question. But yes, I would like to see some validity to what they're saying before I indulge the premise. Thing that showed that their narrative was a piece of horse manure. It's so insulting <laughs> when they write phony stories that they know are fake news. Because they're not insulting me, they're insulting everybody, these incredible people that have worked so hard, so long, that are thinking about nothing other than this invisible enemy. Our peak hospitalized census for COVID patients was about 9,600 over the summer. And it shows you how dishonest, <laughs> these are smear murders, sick people, and they put that crap together. So that's why nobody. What's more blatant, the uh, Pete Buttigieg Obama impression or the Ron DeSantis Trump impression? Go. I think it's got to be DeSantis because it seems studied, whereas Obama, I think, just like his sheer sort of charismatic force over these sorts of guys, I think just bleached their personality dry like, yeah. in the past, like in his eight years. Whereas like Santos is like, Oh, this is, I, I need something. Um, as opposed to reading books in front of, to my kids that uh, is Trump. <laughs> like I'm going to just, yeah. Like basically ape his tone and comportment. Between the one and one and the five, do you want run or the done? <laughs> Aaron is not cool. Jordan Klepper just did another video and there are like 15 year old uh, kids who are dressing and talking like Trump with all the hand gestures. Yikes. Right handed lefty. The podcast behind the bastards taught me homeopathy stems from a time when doctors doing nothing was accidentally more helpful than not on average. Thanks for the great interview today. And happy birthday, Emma. The MR crew and guests helped me maintain the remnants of my sliver of hope for humanity these days. And shout out to my corporate overlords unknowingly paying me to enjoy the show. Yes. That is my favorite kind of message. If you're listening to the show on a job site uh, Mm -hmm. or any sort of workplace, that is awesome to me. uh, Trans sister rodeo. Perineum sunning or butthole sunning is a fad wellness practice that involves exposing the perineum area. Yeah, I got it. I know what that is. The sunlight. Adherents uh, claim various unproven health benefits, such as improved libido, circulation, sleep, and longevity. That's, I mean, it's very easy for me to imagine there being some sort of placebo effect to thinking that you're um, infusing yourself with the power of the solar system. As opposed to just like being in the sun, which already makes you sometimes yeah, feel nice. Yeah, and exercising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> being outdoors, but it's actually the sun in my butt. Um. Anyway, don't clip that. Uh, Coxy Wheatle. I don't know. Uh, happy birthday, Emma. I was a TYT subscriber, but switched over to MR when I learned you'd be working there. I appreciate your interviewing people at Trump rallies. You've got a great reporting style. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Wartz, my wife, who is also an elder millennial, has always been annoyed with the cool girl types. I'm definitely a younger millennial, but thank you. I am 28 today. I don't know. Rally's younger than me, though. Why are we talking about the cool girl types? I don't know. I think uh, what I was talking about in terms of uh, bro flamingos, bro flamingos call. 
Uh, Rory Gatto, I've never been to a DSA meeting or any protest picket line union meeting or any other organizing activity where folks were talking about Jimmy Dore or spouting any of their fake nonsense. Yeah. Emma in the shadows. Happy birthday, Emma. My birthday is tomorrow. Almost twins. Many, many years apart. I hope Sam gets you better lighting for your birthday. <laughs> we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. Joe Biden, happy birthday, Emma. You actually share a birthday with my good friend, Corn Pop. Also, don't forget on Wednesday, we need to blaze up. I have a, the DEA at a uh, meeting, Jack. Hump day is going to be lit. Oh, hell yeah. Spy trance. Happy sun cycle, Emma. Your impressions are getting really good. We'll see. Oh, that is... There we go. Broke that, the seal. That really is ASMR. Um... Zamboni, Zamboni lad, Zamboni lad. Well, went to uh, went to a wedding in Alabama over the weekend, and the amount of misogynistic rhetoric that was part of the ceremony was insane. It really illustrated that mainstream Christianity sees me as superior to women, and that it's a mainstream tenet of their beliefs. I don't know if our uh, buddy uh, Ronald Reagan's listening, but I heard of a wedding uh, between uh, somebody and. Uh, the woman was a Mormon and they had it at a Mormon uh, place. And that those vows were insane. <laughs> what were they? They were like extremely like, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm just not as sensitive to how they are in other um, sort of the Christian religions, but like very, I will be subservient. Yes, sir. Sort of thing. <laughs> wow. Jesus. It is like the, um, the Cam Newton clip from a few from last week where he said that like, you know, women just need to learn how to be quiet and make a, make a meal. I forget like, that that was like a mainstream position yeah. for most of a human history uh, <sighs> in the modern era. Yep. And then Zamboni Lad says, I guess ball tan tanning to maintain that lie is just the next logical step. Yeah. <laughs> um, a square. I'm laughing so hard with that commercial. It's so homoerotic. Happy birthday, Emma. It really is. The second shot is literally them squeezing milk out of cow udders which mm -hmm. there's nothing masculine about that like the cow is not masculine the action of squeezing the udders like i don't know how you could code that as masculine um because i guess it's it's hard it's a forearm workout but like i don't know my understanding of dairy farms is often the women that that's what cows. right exactly yeah. <laughs> all right let's take another call call Calling from a 215 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 215. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, guys. This is Matthew of Philadelphia. Hey, Matthew. <clears throat> uh, sorry to bother you guys at work. Um, <laughs> All good. So, um, to follow up on Kowalski, and to uh, bring it back down after the uh, scrotum talk, which I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, I am like almost paralyzed with uh, anxiety about climate change. Um, I mean, I'm working, obviously. I mean, oh, look, that's overstating it. I mean, I'm, but like, it's starting to really affect me day to day. I'm sure I'm, I'm not the only one. Um, and I feel like sometimes I'm going insane um, I'm always, I've always been uh, the type of person that probably posts too much politics on Facebook. And I think only about like five people still have not like unfollowed me, but just, you know, I never see anyone talking about it uh, really, or taking it as seriously as the latest report indicates it is, which if I'm not mistaken, says we have what, three years to cut emissions by 50% or we're living on a dead planet. Yeah. Um, so like that's, I, I mean, other than in the sixties, I guess with nuclear Holocaust uh, being on the brink of that, I, I mean, I don't think our species has ever faced a threat like that. And so it seems like there's a lot of, you know, there's the, there's the outright denial that you see on the right, but I think there's also this, um you, you cycle you 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 say you believe in it because you know you're a rational person but your actions do not in any way uh align with that belief because if we truly believed that that report is accurate 
I mean, I'm sitting here, what am I, I'm working to get money for my kids to go to college. Like, are they going to go to college and is it going to matter? Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, I'll stop with the, uh, the venting, but I had an idea that I'm going to start doing nearby me and my wife are going to, my wife and I are going to try and start holding meetings with uh, our friends and family. Cause you know, hopefully everyone's just not talking about it and people don't like to post politics on Facebook. Um, so maybe our, my perception that no one is really taking it seriously is flawed. And so, but anyways, the idea is to try to just set like a bare minimum amount of climate action for uh, people who aren't necessarily um, as plugged in as probably this audience is, you know, but there's probably a lot of people engaging in actual organizing and actual uh, on the street work. But we're gonna try pushing a message that's that's like, you know, make it a budget item. Like if if you, these three things can't be true. You can't be sane, believe in the scientific consensus on climate change, but spend more per month on your third favorite streaming service than you do, you know, contributing to say Sunrise or Extinction Rebellion. Like, well, right. I mean, one that it's hard. Accurate. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. It's hard to look. I mean, first of all, let me just say this. Um, your inability to compartmentalize that kind of stuff, it's that's laudable, right? Um, it shows that you are not like you don't have cognitive dissonance about your regular life and the world at large. Um, and I think that that is something that a lot of activists struggle with. It's something I struggle with um, in my profession. But there's only so much that individuals can do, right? Um, and so I think putting it on people and in regards to their streaming services and what they donate to and stuff, it's not fully helpful because this has to be a, th th there's no other solution except for the government to intervene. You know what I mean? Of course. I mean, that's why, I mean, what's con what controls the government? Money in politics, right? Yeah. So like, we need to pump in money on our side. That's why, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you would disagree with those two groups as being like the most effective. No, I, I definitely, definitely both of those are, are, are great organizations. Yes. Right. So, you know, I'm trying to make it um, so you don't feel like as an individual, you have to solve this. You just say, okay, I'm going to, we're going to make it a budget item, you know, $10 a month. And look, and not everyone has that. Don't, I mean, I, I understand that. And, People, there's some people that can't, um, you know, can't can't spare anything, and I, I I recognize that. But the population I'm going to be talking to, you know, we are the people that have two, three streaming services, and I, and look, I like your, I I respect your feedback, so I, I'll take it to heart. But my thinking was, if you frame it like that, like something that people logically, hopefully, rationally goes, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Like, I, I, there is a bare minimum I can do. Yeah. While still maintaining my normal life. That that's that's the angle we were gonna try and go for. But yeah, I I think um, that I mean I think any sort of a, any efforts in this direction I think are positive. Um, and I think the tough thing is getting um, is understanding that like it is limited and it is not going to be enough to actually solve the problem. Um, I do think it's similar to the um effect of like uh, the historical experience of a whole lot of people wanted slavery to be over obviously the slaves and a lot of like people in the north particularly like they but what can we do it's just we're just going to have to let it go and ultimately we need to fight a civil war over it and uh, lead to the uh, a kind of uh centralized mobilization of forces that um the world had never seen before and like I think, but I think that doesn't mean that all the things that abolitionists or people resisting slavery did before that weren't, were insufficient because they were too individual. I think they were all important and led up to the moment. So I, I think like whatever you, whatever anybody can do. And I think that's, that's a, as good an idea as any. Yeah. I mean, and I, I did not mean to discount that. I just meant in terms of like, um, you know, individuals who might be for their own, <laughs> Like uh, self-preservation mentally, honestly, compartmentalizing it to a degree 
that's just a natural human mm. reaction. We have to fight against that collectively, but uh, from also from like a systemic perspective. For sure. I appreciate the call, Matt. Thanks, Thank guys. you, though. Take care. Take care. All right, let's uh, let's do another clip. Oh my god! All right, so. Ilhan Omar was dragged by right-wing Twitter for pointing this out. But this is a good thing to point out. Oh, a hundred percent. So he, uh, I can just read it here. So before we watch this, this is a video of a bunch of Christians singing on a plane, um, and bothering everybody on that plane. Which uh, this was, this is like my worst nightmare as somebody who likes to try to sleep on planes or at the very least just watch my movie. Right. Yeah. Do we know when in this was a red eye flight? Do we know was this the um, shortly after um, taking off, or was this like after the night of sleeping and then <laughs> you had to watch this? I have no. I mean, yeah. at least it looks like it's in the daytime, so it's not worthy of. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, uh, throwing a fit on the plane. But Ilhan Omar says, "I think my family and I should have a prayer section session next time I am on a plane. How do you think it will end?" So compare that comment to what we see here. Jesus, these people look miserable. So there's there's um, not a whole lot of reporting out yet on like the full context, but it looks like this was like maybe a flight to or from Germany of, with like a Christian group on board. It's just not clear whether no the, one's wearing a mask, by it, the way. Right. It's okay. just it's just not clear whether this entire plane was for that group or whether this was like a mixture of you know obviously private citizens and a christian group well i'll just say if this entire plane is for that group and that's the response that those people got uh yeah it's pretty it says exactly what we would say even if it wasn't a church group which is sit the fuck down and shut up yeah there's nothing i i don't get that bad at claustrophobia but if i'm at the very like back of a plane I can get a little bit of like, damn, I'm really like Antiness. back here. Yeah. yeah. And like the idea that, I, no, I don't want any of your Christian songs. I don't want like, oh man. That is I mean, worst I, kind of I get even world. like, I, f I need to do a deep breathing if I'm on in the aisle or I'm in the middle or whatever. If I'm in a seat and I'm next to somebody and their elbow keeps like hitting into me. Right. Th that kind of intrusion. It's just like, Jesus Christ. And uh, no pun intended as opposed. And, <laughs> I already hate performative stuff like this. I hate, um, for me, there's nothing worse than sitting in a small room and having to watch someone perform on the guitar, right? I've always thought, like, as somebody who can, or I haven't played in ages, but I could play a little bit of guitar, but the serenade yes. always seemed very awkward. <laughs> because it's it's about you, and it's performative. And if I, and the, it, you're... I have a, a face that will is very, I'm very, it's very difficult to hide my contempt or my feelings. So I would be visibly disgusted by whatever happened here. And especially in like a small enclosed room where you have a friend that's like, I have this new song. I want to try out this new cover. It's not, not for me. Um, on a plane when you're in an enclosed space, very bad. And then, like, well, we bring it to Ilhan Omar's point, which is, uh, say there were a bunch of uh, Muslim plane uh, riders, patrons, whatever, who did a call to prayer or were uh, had some sort of, like, religious song that they were singing. What would the reaction be then? The plane would be landed. <laughs> also, I'll make the uh, COVID uh, uh, nerd point. Singing is even worse than, like, first of all, I don't understand how no one was wearing a mask. Yeah. Because that is not my experience of, like, particularly, like, flying to Europe, which I did, like, a few months ago. Um, You, you wear a mask. like, if, And I had to wear a special one because my Adidas one <laughs> wasn't up to stuff. So I don't know why no one was wearing masks. But singing and projecting out like that, like, let okay, just give me your COVID, please. Yes. Right. I mean, it could not be worse. Uh, in terms of like the projectile spit that's happening right there with the COVID. I, yeah, I don't really know, but point being is, um, 
Yeah. Sit, sit down and shut up. <laughs> we don't want to hear this shit. The, the thing Christians love to hear. Yeah. Um, Rory Gatto, do you think those guys and gals were just trying to get laid because there are less offensive ways to get your junk touched? <laughs> Lots of junk talk on the show today. Um, Rory Gatto, I would have yelled at them, maybe even opened the door if I was on that flight. <laughs> Power of One. Emma, as a longtime fan of the Majority Report, I must say your advice to the caller who was anxious about climate change was quite disturbing. You said the individual can't do much. We can organize, talk to family, friends, and share how we can change our lifestyle. When he talked about money power to counter money power, it, it was laughable. If progressives like him and you think we need to just wait till government action, good luck. Happy birthday. Um, that's not really what I was saying. I just meant in terms of... Warning against consumption focus. Yeah. Like we are only think we're empowered as consumers, uh, and that is a problem. That it's always worth bringing up. I think, particularly in the climate change context, that this does need to be individuals can't. Like I don't know if that's disturbing, but this isn't a, a individual. Like individuals can only do something toward a collective uh, course of action, and right. consumption choices aren't that. Calling from a 917 number. Who's this where you're calling from? 917. Happy birthday. It's Alex from New York. Oh, thank you, Alex. You did not uh, have to serenade me. At least I wouldn't have had to look you in the eye when that happened. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, yes. Happy birthday. Um, welcome to Closer to 30. Thank you. And, uh, let me give you a little bit of uh, of a happy uh, fight club for you. There we go. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. <laughs> okay. Just for your birthday. Okay. I mean, I still have this list. Um, Jesse Waters versus Steven Crowder and Kimberly Guilfoyle versus Laura Trump. Gilfoyle is Gilfoyle is a Gilfoyle. psycho. So yeah, I, I, Gilfoyle. like she is like the the best is yet to come. I take Gilfoyle over most conservative yeah, yeah. women. I think she's <laughs> she, she fights <laughs> dirty. There's no question she fights dirty. I'd yeah. be worried about Gilfoyle versus myself, honestly. Yeah. Um, she she'd beat the shit out of me. And as uh, Waters, it's like two cowards facing off against each other, and we kind of. But I would say exactly. probably I'd, I'd probably it's say Waters, waters still. Yeah. Yeah. Totally Waters. And Waters has some game experience when he fought Ryan, so there's there's that as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Waters has been there before. Uh, well, I mean, they've both technically been there before, because um, Waters. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Crowder has taken a punch, I guess that's true. Yeah, Waters got beat up by Ryan Grimm. Um, and, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and Crowder awesome. got beat up by a Union guy. Crowder, I, I yeah, Crowder's got it. Like you talk about the definition of a glass jaw. Like that guy would, yeah. he would not withstand any sort of, uh, like, impact. <laughs> really, it, the first impact, he'd be, he'd be crumpled. The definition of to like muscles for show as opposed to actual functionality. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. Like it's it's well, it's, it's very okay. funny to like do all that like weightlifting, but also foreground that you have a firearm to protect yourself. <laughs> Like, what are you doing? Like, like, this isn't enough. Not in the I ring, he this. doesn't. The, yeah. <laughs> the only reason I would ever, like, work out that much is to be able to, like, strong arm somebody and to, like, move my, maneuver them out of being a threat to myself. We so, should ask Brandon about what that feels like. In yeah. Terms yeah. Of, yeah. Right? <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, Alex. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Happy birthday. Thank you. Waters is tall, too. Yeah. I think Waters would definitely win. I feel like I think I, I no, I think Kimberly Guilfoyle would beat the shit out of me, actually. I mean, because I'm I'm not fast, but I am pretty strong, um, I think. So maybe I just want to see what how now I'm like, how tall are you? I'm 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 five nine, five eight. OK, five, so nine. you got the slight height advantage. OK, close five seven. Now, nah, I still think she'd beat the hell out of me. I just She's so crazy. I, yeah, I was just gonna say. I just think you're lacking the key derangement aspect. I'm not. I don't. I've never like gotten into a physical fight except for with my sister when we were growing up, <laughs> like wrestling for the remote and things like that. That's how it goes. <laughs> um. All right. Let's let's do another clip. Oh, uh, here we go. This the the thing on Greg Abbott from the Five. Let's do that. This is the Five, right? So yeah, it's a, it's like a kind of a weird crew. It's like Judge Janine, 
Jess Tarlov, who's like the liberal stick in the mud there. Lawrence Jones, who's like the Fox and Friends fill-in on the weekend. Um, Kennedy, who mm. one of my faves. And then yeah. Ty- Ty- former professional wrestler Tyrus, who is also like apparently a pervert and has just like been promoted to be on, like a, you know, a guest spot here. Makes sense. Um, they, here they are talking about Greg Abbott's stunt at the border where um, he had been implementing these truck inspections along the border that was causing such severe backups that it was disrupting the supply chain because this was all a performative uh, uh, way for him to catch up to to uh, Ron DeSantis in the governors who want to run for president race. So how many performative things can I do to appeal to the larger conservative base in the country? Build up my bona fides. Greg Abbott has failed spectacularly. So even the Fox News crew finds this stunt to be embarrassing. Point about the rule about the extra inspections. That is not a victory for Governor Abbott. It is an embarrassment what happened to him. He had Republicans turn on him. The AG commissioner spoke out about it. The American Trucking Association, huge allies of his, the CEO of Brothers Produce called it a train wreck. But well, that proves business. my point. He what, got the unaffected. Are you, so, so, yeah, okay, so you guys sit here every day and complain about inflation and the supply chain That's crisis. What it? That's true. And yeah. welcome. Thank I'm you. thrilled to have you here Thank on you. this special day. <laughs> Complain about inflation, the supply chain crisis. What is President Biden doing? What is Greg, Greg Abbott doing? He's adding to All it. All right, well, that's what okay, happened. Let me, let me ask the follow So that is true. I mean, I forgot that she was the liberal one, so. But- She's like, she just comes on to kind of like have them all yell at her at some point. Yeah. Wait, was that Kennedy? No, no. Kennedy, Kennedy's over there with the glass. Just, that's uh, just Tarlov. Tarlov. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, like, they, they had to concede that point. It, it, it was ridiculous. I mean, we had uh, David Griscom on the show to talk about it. I wonder if he could have, like, you know, I, we should reach out to him about an update because he was saying that it was a matter of time before shelves started to be empty with food because the supply chain was so disrupted by these cumbersome inspections that were required by Abbott. And then he had to save face, go to different Mexican governors and ask them, if they could strike a deal, oh, we'll let these trucks come come through in these checkpoints. But you got to get really tough on immigration. And they're like, OK, yeah, sure, buddy. Because, I mean, there's there, there's nothing that they can do. There's nothing that they can do. He just wanted to appear as such. He face planted in this. Yeah. And like the thing that um, when she when she mentions the CEO statement and the association, the truckers association, and they say, yeah, finally, like we're hitting the people that don't get hit. It's like this. This is the like, the thing that they always say about oh, you can't do anything against um, bosses in this country. Otherwise, it's going to be passed on to consumers. Yeah. The price. No, no. This is exactly what that is. If you really want to hit these, the capitalists and the CEOs and the like, sort of business associations, you tax them, right? And you regulate them. You and th- this idea that like we can just stop their functioning entirely. And not face a massive um, economic price, which is going to again, in actually be passed down to regular people facing inflation. So like, and and if this isn't this is a pattern. I was a little bit dismissive of the idea that the um, Canadian convoy stuff was a a similar sort of plot to sort of screw uh, um, up transportation at the border and ma- basically make the economy worse. This is two in a row now. Yeah. And you basically need three, in my opinion, to uh, um, sort of set a pattern. Rule of but threes. Two, yeah, exactly. But two is like, that's a coincidence. We're seeing a coincidence, and maybe there's a correlation there. All right, let's do this uh, a little bit more serious Blaze TV thing now. Um, so we've been saying for a while on the show that this anti-trans push and this focus on like a particular college swim meet to attempt to extrapolate that onto athletes, demonize, marginalize trans kids in this country. They they want to bully trans kids out of existence. They don't want to see them. They want them back in the closet. And if they're not in the closet, they're fine with them dying. I, I mean, let's be real here because, you know, they just don't, think their existence is natural and they're fine with trans kids being so unhappy that they're not able to exist in society that is the conservative agenda on this front yes they want that they want that 
And nothing demonstrates that more than this Blaze TV host, Elijah Schaefer. And somebody, this guy was on, is on Steven Crowder's show, right? Dave yeah, Landau? Yeah, Dave, yeah. They're just talking about the idea of killing trans kids. Okay, so what are you talking about? They go, well, he, he goes, well, the problem is, is that there is this mass genocide happening of trans kids from fascists. And I just said, where? Yeah, where? Listen to this. They go, well, in Texas, which I'm like, I'm well aware I live here. Yeah. So do you, I'm assuming. Yeah, we all have to put a trans kid and drag him behind a truck. <laughs> yeah. Which, I, how many trans kids did you kill this week? Uh, six. Uh, they come with a toll tag. <sighs> Just I remind me, you told me you did three. I did four. I was trying to beat you this week. Oh, not bad. That's pretty good. This is what they did. Crowder's team's better at everything, whether it's well, views, it's, you know, oh, you got bits and writers, and then it's like, oh, can I not at least get the trans genocide on my side? The Blaze ships us the better trans kids. I feel really, really <laughs> cheated. It's a murder. I you feel, should talk to them. Um, I feel really cheated because I, oh, I get my Patriot Supply ads and stuff. Meanwhile, you get trans kids to genocide. Trans kids supply. Yeah, it's trans a pretty good company. <laughs> my they, trans kids. They come in a tackle box. It's like a half dozen. And you kill them any way you want. It's pretty good. It's only in Texas, though, apparently. Yeah, apparently. I didn't know that because I've been too. killing them everywhere, so I better stop. <laughs> yeah, I started in California. Talk about the Trail of Tears. Yeah, I, did this, I did version two. It's a new movie. Yeah. <laughs> 12 years of slave. I've been doing it for 28. Yeah. <laughs> All these references really sort of showed the imagination of oh, these yeah. guys. Uh, Trail of Tears bit. and 12 years of slave, right? Anything, yeah. Anything um, that like actually sheds light on, you know, I don't know, the way the United States has treated certain groups in this country are deserving of mockery. Also, the riffing doesn't make sense. No. Um, th but they're just at the forefront of their mind because they find it like you know, contem uh, contemptible that the, there would, was ever a focus on this. But Not the, that 12 Years to Slave wasn't But they messed up but... the joke. Like, nobody's saying it's only in Texas. I think people who are concerned about the well-being of trans folk um, are concerned about them everywhere, <laughs> uh, not just Texas. So, like, I hate to be like – this is why Sam can't enjoy comedy because he gets too hung up on the premises, even if it agrees with, like, what mm -hmm. he believes. It's like, even if I believed that this whole thing was ludicrous and we should joke about – like that's not the argument people are making that it's only in Texas, but anyway, it's yeah. A little bit more. <laughs> at I just least you were supposed to. At least they to. fed their slave. Mine, mine are all dead. <laughs> it's true. And then they're, but it's like you got to. But it's for the people. There's like landmarkings. The crosses are across. Right. Actually, they're pentagrams across. Well, the, you know, so you follow them across the desert, and you end up in Texas, yeah. where it's legal. Yes. And so I was like, well, where, where are people genociding trans kids? And they're like, well, you know, this Texas law where they take away children from their parents. <clears throat> and I just said, can I just clarify? So your definition of genocide is very different than my definition. Is that, was that, is that the end of the clip? Yeah. That's frustrating because I want to see where he goes there. Um, it was difficult to find this clip because if we can just pull up the Mediate article on this particular video and just scroll down. Um, Blaze TV host Elijah Schaefer joked at length about killing trans kids in the recent interview in response to a claim from an unnamed person that, quote, genocide is being committed against trans people, which, by the way, they are using, and this is a tactic of the right all the time, using a claim that might be a little bit, in terms of the facts of the matter, inflammatory and an exaggeration, I guess, to the in in their in their estimation, they use that as a straw man to discredit all leftist critique of their bigotry towards trans people. The full conversation was graphic enough that it was edited out of versions of the show that were posted to Apple and Spotify. So this is why Mediate had to clip it in uh, here because it was not widely available. In a, in a disclaimer added to the podcast after it was recorded, Schaefer says, "This is a part of the show where Elijah talks about." Uh, things he shouldn't have it can't be on the main internet but you can find it on blaze tv.com for the full uncensored video oh wow what a tease um and i'm I'm just curious where he went there with what he um thinks genocide is because my ex um, kidnapping fully uh falls under that like the idea that you would take that that's like sort of part and parcel with how genocide has been conducted in America is taking particularly indigenous children or say African children, um, but indigenous children to put in them in say boarding schools or things like that, like re-education. And, and, and so like anybody who has been sort of actually following uh, like what's 
our sort of Western awareness of the genocide that's created um, in the construction of these con- countries would be aware of that is that it's actually not outrageous to understand like when you have a government and this sort of like no I, I no I, I understand what you're saying like yeah that, this is the exact same thing when it was like concentration camps at the border that's crazy and now it's moved to well apparently they're not concentration camps when joe biden's there no the, these sorts of camps are concentration camps that's just fundamentally like yes like and for the, what it's they are. definitionally what they are like it might not lead to a sort of exterminatory holocaust mm-hmm. uh, knock on wood for christ's sake mm-hmm. um but that doesn't mean that you deny the like uh, what a, 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 con- a, a concentration camp is um and the United like, States uh, had concentration concentration camps for Japanese Americans during World War II, exactly. for example, and it did not result in the same extermination as you, or in extermination as you say, right. as Hitler and and the Nazis did. But the like setting the threshold for what a concentration camp is to only meet the definition of, of what was done in World War II with yeah, the Jaco. Jews and, and 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 more groups by the Nazis. That's that's crazy. They are concentrating groups of people and are uh, holding them there in inhumane ways. Yeah, and I I do think like you look at the epidemic we have of sort of mental health and like suicide of trans folks. Like this is all this is like part of that machinery that produces that outcome. And fine, call them internment camps, whatever. But like they they the parsing of that language is meant to sanitize this, which is to Matt's point. Last year, a survey found that 42% of respondents seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year. For transgender and non-binary youth, it was more than half in terms of the suicide rates that they have uh, tracked among young people. Among the respondents, 12% of white youth attempted suicide compared to 31% of native and indigenous youth, 21% of black youth, 21% of multiracial youth, 18% of Latinx youth, and 12% of Asian Pacific uh, Islander youth. And you can trace those larger statistics for LGBTQ youth and trans youth to like uh, a lack of acceptance by society as codified through legislation that is being championed by these people who are joking about, not by them uh, particularly, but by the politicians that they support joking about killing trans kids oh it's so funny and i'm just looking at just to keep this in people's mind uh this is from the international criminal court uh article six of this document um elements of crimes uh which is different kinds of genocide genocide by killing genocide by causing serious bodily or mental harm genocide by deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction genocide by imposing measures intended to prevent births genocide by forcibly transferring children oh there you go Benny P, I'd like to hear Emma's take on how she interprets chivalry in the context of today's gender dynamics. I remember after the Will Smith debate, Emma was very strong in saying that men don't need to stick up for women. This is not what I said. Because it can undermine women's agency to reinforce toxic norms. I was raised by a single mom who taught me to always look out for women in a caretaking way, coming from a place of love and respect. I have applied that in my life and towards my wife and daughters, but I'm wondering if my views need updating. Interesting, Interested to hear your thoughts. I mean, again, it's, it's not fully what I, I you know, a mischaracterization of my position. I didn't mean to come hard on you there, Benny P. Um, but I, uh, I do think that there is like an element of toxic, toxic masculinity that feels it is their duty, men's duty to physically stand up for women in terms of like insults. And particularly in that case, I, I, through an act of violence that I would not have appreciated. Um, I think that outbursts of violence are like a part of toxic masculine expectations of certain men that I wish would go away. And so, I mean, I I think chivalry is respecting your wife or your partner's agency if you're in a heterosexual relationship. And unless there is a physical assault on them, not responding with violence <laughs> that's my opinion on that i think uh chivalry is when a knight has an affair with a lady of the castle when the nobleman is out um collecting taxes 
Isn't that the premise of uh, that Matt Damon movie? No, I, I'm a, Matt Damon did a period piece in. Are you oh, uh, the, the the last, last duel? Night, the last, last duel, duel, right? Yeah. Except actually, it's really about Matt. You would really like that movie. Is he like Jason Bourne of uh, of medieval England? Yeah, it's like it's like Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, and like very garish hair pieces. Uh, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's uh, Ridley Scott directed it. I'm pretty yeah, sure. And, yeah, and Adam Scott. I mean, That's not hilarious. Adam Scott, Adam, Adam, movie Adam Driver. Oh, yeah, and Driver. Yeah. No, it was known as a box office flop because it's like, uh, but despite getting very good reviews, and I really liked it, it was co-written by Matt Damon and uh, Ben Affleck. Did you say that, Bradley? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, and it, it and also a woman who I, it's presented in three chapters, first from Matt Damon's perspective as the man uh, who's married to the wife, then from Adam Driver's perspective, who was the accused rapist, and then from the wife's perspective at the end. Um, and it's very good. It's very good. I highly recommend it. It's like the... It's, check that out. It's such a dying breed of movie where every movie is either a $5 million indie <laughs> or a $200 million fucking Marvel movie. Every movie. And this was like a middle of the road period piece action movie that got like it completely bombed, but it was really good, um, especially in comparison to like more recent Ridley Scott movies like the Noah, The Last Ark, which was terrible or whatever. So, um, I would encourage everybody to watch The Last. So on School. HBO looks like. Yes, check it out. Check it out. All right, this will be the final call of the day. Calling from a 212 number. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, guys. Is this... Emma, did you read it wrong? It's 219. Oh, yes. 219. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. Is it? Is it like... Do you confuse twos with nines? or Because this is the second time it's happened. <laughs> um, because I, I, I have had a white claw. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's fair. Usually... Usually white claws. Uh, yeah, right. Know, All right. Well, uh, it's Sam uh, calling from the industrially ravished Gary, Indiana, um, also known as not a libertarian Sam. I called a couple couple weeks ago. Gotcha. Nice. We had okay. a conversation. I don't know if you remember me, but I'm the uh, the, the pro Second Amendment uh, leftist, um, and I feel like uh, we kind of left off on a note where I feel like I didn't get my full point out. Um, so I decided to call back, and thanks for taking my call. Yeah. Go ahead. What's up? Yeah. So at the end of that call, um, uh, Matt made a statement. He said, it's my commie, my commie personality or something like that. Um, I'm not saying it verbatim, but uh, it's my commie personality or something like that that leads me to not care so much about the Constitution. Um, and during that call, I, I said something to the effect of, I understand the sentiment of, you know, anti anti-Constitution. You know, it's written by slave owners, probably a bunch of pedophiles. And I, and I understand that, but, you know, the reason that I hold so much uh, power to the Constitution is because it's, it's the, you know, the, um, it's the bill or it's the paperwork that uh, gives us some sort of leverage against, uh, against uh, the state. You know, earlier in the call, you talked about the power of the state and how it's sometimes over, overpowering. Um, last week, you had that conversation with a guy from France who talked about how Macron was trying to reduce... Um, you know, uh, journalist rights to, to film police officers. And that's sort of happening here too. Um, you know, it happens all the time. There's a genre on YouTube or anywhere that um, of police officers violating civil rights and, or, you know, people getting arrested for no crime. Um, and then, you know, they have to go through a really pricey, you know, judicial system that favors the state, protects, you know, protects, uh, protects state employees and really just throws the uh, throws the full barrel of of uh, of power on on citizens, and um, you know undermining the constitution. While I I could see you know an argument for it, uh, I think if we do uh, amend the constitution, it would be to give more rights, not take you know rights away. Which you know the anti Second Amendment um, you know people that believe in that or or, or proponents of that. Uh, would hold truth to. So um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, our rights in many aspects are being pushed back against. 
you know, two years ago, uh, protesters were getting picked up by U-Haul vans and, you know, dropped off in other random places, which are, you know, uh, against, you know, our Fourth Fourth Amendment right, you know, our First Amendment right. And um, there was nothing really done against that. And, you know, you know, some people scoff at the idea that our, uh, you know, our rights are being taken away, but it's happening right in front of our face. And to be on the left and understanding the, the impact, the socioeconomic impact of, um, you know, uh, our judicial system and things of that matter. Uh, it's, it's really inconsiderate of us to also be for a regulation of the second amendment. Um, so maybe can I hear your thoughts on, on that sort of, sort of, uh, idea? Yeah. I mean, first and most, I think, uh, it's also kind of secondary is that I, I have a slight disagreement, whereas I think the constitution is how the state gives power to itself over everybody. And I think like in, in limited contexts and there are important things where it's delivered for folks like you say about the search and seizures and stuff but i think very um regularly that stuff is just ran roughshod over but i do think you make a good point in saying that if you're going to have this effort and you have this political sort of uh will are you going to spend that in taking rights away from folks and that is persuasive to me because i do think like rather than attacking a right to bear arms i would rather give people a, a you know a right to health care or a right to vote or something like that right so exactly. I, I think that exactly. i do agree with you on that point yeah because i think um you, you said it you know in a really well placed way um you know i think gun violence isn't caused by guns it's caused by you know outside factors that promote violence um you know we see that and we're really you know we're proponents of that when we speak about crime and we talk about you know, the outside factors that cause violence and trigger violence and violence is more of the, the effect, not, you know, the cause of, you know, other things. Um, and, you know, saying that, or being, uh, and, and the, on the mindset that guns are cause or are causal of violence, it's kind of, uh, you know, aligning with the ideology of the conservative people who, who think that, you know, crime is, uh, you know, the problem, uh, and not the, uh, the effect of, you know, the, uh, exploitation of people. Um, so, so I'm glad you kind of, uh, understand my point on that aspect. Yep. Uh, well, I appreciate it, Sam. Thanks yeah. so much for calling in. Not a libertarian. Thanks for the call. Too. Yes. Okay. You are not, you will, Welcome will uh, be calling you not a libertarian from here on out. How's that sound? I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it means more than you guys think. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, left is best and happy birthday, Emma. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, I, I, I hope that your next year around the sun goes well. Thank you so much. So sweet. Thanks, Sam. Bye. It's very astronomical well-wishing. Yes. Next journey around the sun. Right. I mean, I when I think about that too hard, I get uh, scared about my... A little bit vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about how small we are and how the universe is so large and we'll never fully understand... What is outside of our galaxy? We're just on like a floating rock. And we're beyond, it's beyond our mental capacity to understand how uh, vastly uh, small we are in the rest of the world, of the uh, planets. And I'm going to read some IMs right after here. I never watched it, but Third Rock from the Sun, the title of that show always like made me like sent me into danger. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite tweets is someone who tweeted something like, we're just on a floating rock paying bills. Damn. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> Skippy. Em uh, Emma, Guilfoyle is just a cokehead. You would beat her ass. Just pretend it's a hockey fight. Oof. Tony, guess we know how, uh, we now know why Roger Ailes' balls were red like a raw hamburger. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dan from PA, New Jersey is set to begin recreational weed sales on April 21st. It's a great, it's great for us in Eastern PA, but feels like they really missed an opportunity there. Um, you mean on 420? Uh, consumption pattern. Matt, when you say consumption changing as an individual is not too effective, how do you defend the existence of the majority report? You keep saying along with Sam and Emma that you are here to change media consumption of youth and progressives. So are you not impacting anything in the real world by doing so much every day? 
and we should all just collectively stop watching all other YouTube shows to watch yours. Your logic is super flawed. Oh, excuse uh, me. That's not a consumption choice in the same way that it is like I can't, you know, I'm going to make these choices that largely only people who have the means to make can make to combat climate change in in like uh, a vacuum of like state response and global response yeah i'm not really sure what uh you're imputing to our vision of the goal of majority report but we've said i think relatively recently that <clears throat> this is defensive uh this show is defensive basically defend people who are actually doing the actual work that needs to get done and uh so like if you stopped listening to the majority report entirely and started organizing your community i would take that as a victory frankly um benny p i'm so tired of 2a people thinking they can go against the government with handguns it's a fantasy violence happens everywhere it's just more deadly in the u.s where everyone is packing sensible regulations now agreed Prairie Fire Kowalski, don't dread on climate change. It is bad and we need to be making greater action, but ultimately it is not going to happen until society takes action. Talk with your friends and family about the facts, but ultimately without the empire making climate change a priority, it will not change. To keep saying, I personally think of solutions. We will solve climate change, but the question is how fast and how many will suffer in the meantime. Yep, stay informed and stay active. Left is poggers, left is plant garden. As to gun control, I would never want people to take my like, sort of lax attitude towards cracking down and you know, taking guns off the streets to suggest that I think that it makes us safer that guns are out there. I just think it's difficult to do and who gets uh, caught up in it is typically not white people. And, um, and so I would put my priorities elsewhere, but if I could go back and make the America less soaked in guns than it is, uh, you'd probably start back at 150 years or so. Um, I would do that. I-5, same Christian crew was filmed uh, later playing for Ukrainian refugees. Michigan uh, Missionaries love a captive audience. Wow. If that's true, that's hilarious. Robo Gor Robo Gorka, as a formerly trained musician, I love ruining these kinds of moments. Clap on one and three, sing a half step sharp or flat, ad lib uh, supportive commentary between stanzas, sing loudly in the wrong words. I fucking love this game. Uh, we're going to read like five more of these and get out of here. Nicole from Buffalo. Guns may not cause violence, but violence perpetrated with the use of guns is more brutal and efficient than it would be otherwise. Not to mention that part of the reason that gun regulation is so lax isn't because of the Constitution, which guarantees the right to a well-regulated militia, not individual arms. It's because of, it is because of gun lobbies. Um, Rob from Dedham. Happy birthday, Emma Celtics in five. They looked pretty good last night or yesterday. I'd say six. Do, do, do. Sa Sanders Chomsky 84. Not sure if you all have covered it yet, but more hopeful news coming out in on the labor front. Business Insider is reporting that Apple employees at their flagship New York location have begun collecting signatures to petition to form a union. Nice. Yeah. Along with three other U.S. retail locations. Happy birthday, Emma, and good job, crew. You've all been killing it in Sam's absence. It's the Thank Grand you. Central location, I think. Oh, nice. That's the that is a massive location. It's right in the middle of the damn train station. I wonder how much they paid for that uh, that real estate. I've thought about that a few times. Um, Queenie Bobini, one bit of advice to my fellow anxiety sufferers who are worried about climate change is to get to know your community and neighbors better. It's in everyone's interest to look out for each other and you must have control and you have most control of helping your immediate community when shit hits the fan. We no longer have the luxury to be siloed. Yes. Steely Danarchy. Good movie to see vis-a-vis anti-woke leftists is pride about lesbian and gay support the miners during the 84 UK miner strike. It's pretty sentimental and shaves off the main character's more radical politics, but still provides a great example of solidarity. And if it doesn't give you the warm fuzzies, I don't know what to tell you. Good, good, uh, good recommendation. Trashweed. The Tucker Carlson ad reminds me of the golden one, a Swedish neo-Nazi bodybuilder who was big in the 2010s. Wouldn't be surprised if he gets a shout out. <laughs> and the final I am of the day. Josh from Tucson. My mother took me to a homeopathy quack when I was a child, and he said I was, quote, hyperactive and forced my mother to take me off sugar completely. She would take me to the supermarket and I would eat a whole box of sprouts as a treat. I'm so sorry, Josh. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, folks. Thanks so much. Great show today.
Appreciate it. See you all tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know. Choice was made.